Welcome everyone to one more edition of the Tian Virtual Workshop in Mathematics. We are very glad to have you here today. My name is Jacqueline Godoy Mesquita. I am a member of the organizing committee. And today I have uh, the honor to uh, invite Professor Romain Murenzi from the executive director of TWAS to uh, say some words here in this opening. So please, Professor Morenzi. Oh, I thought my senior professor, um, David Abitch, will speak first. <laughs> but it's, it's a great honor, really, for me to be, to have an opportunity to, uh, to speak with you here. And um, mathematics is, is, is a very important uh, area, not only in, in its own right, but uh, it is very important that we pay attention in the developing world because this is one of the subjects that we can do even if we don't have access to a big laboratories. So this means that uh, they may not be excused that uh, we don't really excel and do the good mathematics. So probably um, rather than doing any presentation, because uh, although I I'm the executive director of TWAS, I've been doing policy. Um, I do also research on my own on my own time. If you go in Google Scholar with some of my recent papers on, on that. But I'd like to say a few words as, as you are young, probably uh, to say a few words and, and I'm sure David Evich may do the same um, about my, my experience uh, when I was much younger. Uh, I, I received my bachelor's degree in Burundi. Uh, Burundi is, uh, is in Central East Africa, um, but I'm originally from Rwanda. So my family moved in, in Burundi when I was um, three, four years old as a refugee there. And uh, so I grew up in Burundi and did my bachelor's in mathematics. And I became a teacher of mathematics at the age of 23. And um, I did actually mathematics, uh, mathematical physics. It was mostly mathematics, but uh, plus um, relativity and, and cosmology uh, as as the main the main subject. But uh, I was a, a math teacher in secondary school from uh, 1982 to 1985. It was a really a very interesting experience. Uh, my first year as a math teacher was a in an all girls school, very challenging when I arrived there. And I was able to work with these students who actually were behind when I arrived there for many reasons. And I would work even Saturday and Sunday and I would do actually more, almost uh, more than 10 hours per, per week to make sure that these kids are really um, catch up on various um, material and, and, of course, national exams and so forth. And a year later, because of my work uh, in that particular school in the countryside, uh, I was uh, almost promoted to return back to, to the capital of Bujumbura, capital of Burundi, we call Bujumbura. I came there. And that year was also a very interesting year. Uh, I did the same what I was doing in that particular school. Uh, in classrooms, and uh, that year, actually, my students were the best in the nation. Not only I had two, two classrooms, but uh, this classroom, one became first and then they became second, and the best students in the classes were, were from, from, from my, my, uh, my classes. Uh, and I continued for another year, and then uh, at the age of 25, 26, I received a, a scholarship to do a PhD at the Catholic University of Louvain. And what I wanted to do at the time was I wanted to do um, physics and geometry and, and basically uh, in, in that area, probably unifications, all the things that people wanted to do at the time. But and then my supervisor told me, yeah, general relativity is beautiful, it's this and that. People have done so many things. However, if you, you can join this group called Wavelet Theory that adjusted, just that just that just started at the time. Uh, Wavelet transform was very very new at, at the time. So I joined the group and uh, 
possibility for application for analyzing data and signal was there. And that really became a very, very interesting because the fact that the, the subject, the area was very young, it was very important. So, um, and as you are doing your, your research or you are starting, some of you may be doing PhD or some of you may be having a PhD student, it is always good to find areas where you don't have so many people are clogging, <laughs> working. So that also gave me an opportunity really to do, um, I may say mini discovery on my, myself because uh, wavelet transform at the time were on one dimension, translation and dilation on the line. Even when they were doing two dimension, they were doing one translation in vertical, one uh, translation in, in horizontal, one dilation in vertical, one dilation in vertical. So actually I introduced the rotation and that has a, a lot of applications actually in analyzing data image processing. Uh, that gave me an opportunity actually after I finished my PhD to go to, to teach in France and then the postdoc and then went to the US. Uh, so I had an opportunity to grow scientifically uh, because of the, the area that was uh, I started was young at the time and was able to be involved and there was a lot of a lot of mentoring really if you look at the I arrived in 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 in, in Louvain I was uh, I was a refugee so in the first conference to go to France my professor has to call the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Paris for me to get a visa that's a real supervisor and then uh, during that time also it was difficult for me to travel, but one of the professor, Alex Grossman, who was a Jewish, told me, Romain, I was a refugee, so he almost adopted me. So he made, they made me travel like if I was French. They adopted me in the group, so I, I became part of the group. So I was able to grow in that sense. It was not just, just these people were, were, were doing just math and physics and whatever and computation. However, the fact that I was adopted, I was part of the group was, uh, was very important. So I was given opportunity to travel to France several times, Marseille, Bordeaux, of course, Paris. And I was given opportunities to, to travel to, to go to the UK very early. My supervisor will allow me to go to, to go to the UK very early. I went to Rome very early. Uh, although at the time I was almost speaking French, really English was very difficult. And uh, I could see that uh, mobility was a very, very important. Um, this means that if you give a young person a chance to travel and a chance to give presentation in his or her own work is very important. So as uh, the academy, Brazilian Academy is uh, meaning giving you some support, some of you are, are part of the um, Brazilian, it would be very important to give opportunities to these young scientists opportunity to travel and to travel to with um, and have opportunity to to engage with other people so i'd like just to stop here but i, I can have an opportunity if there is any question and other I, but i just mention is that the making sure that we give opportunity to the young people to be able to travel and to be able to give presentation of their work and that is something that is very important. And it has to happen very, very early so that you can get, get confidence. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Morenzi, for your words. And uh, now I have, I have the honor and the privilege to, to invite Professor Luis Davdovich, the president of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Hello. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening for some uh, of the people who are attending this workshop. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and uh, in the opening of this very important activity. I wanted to uh, uh, congratulate the organizers of this workshop, uh, Jacqueline Mesquita, uh, Ferran Valdes, Eduardo Teixeira, Hernan Greco, and Franco Cabrerizo, uh, who come from several places, Brazil, Mexico, uh, United States, uh, Argentina, uh, 
for organizing this this workshop. As Roman uh, has just said, uh, this interaction between young scientists is extremely important. And I do hope that after this terrible pandemics, traveling will be uh, much easier. And of course, uh, uh, international collaborations are extremely important for the advancement of science. I would like also uh, to uh, acknowledge uh, the presence here of uh, Paolo uh, Piccione, who is the president of the Brazilian uh, uh, Mathematical Society. Uh, Jacqueline uh, is the vice president, Jacqueline Godoy Mesquita. So uh, thank you uh, for participating in this organization. I have here a double hat. I'm a president of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and at the same time, I'm secretary general of TWAS. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're my boss. <laughs> yeah, under, under both conditions, <laughs> under both conditions, I'm, I'm very happy that this is being organized. And uh, I do remember the first face-to-face uh, mm -hmm. -face meeting of Tian that was uh, organized in Brazil. It was a beautiful meeting. I still have a, a very nice picture of the young people participating in that meeting who came from all over the world. So I think Tian is a, an amazing initiative. And I do hope that uh, uh, lots of workshops like this one are organized uh, by, by Tian with the support of TWAS. So uh, congratulations. I should maybe uh, also uh, uh, tell you that uh, I am a professor and, uh, and a researcher in physics in the area of quantum information. I am now emeritus professor of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. You know, I had to retire because of uh, uh, age limit. Uh, if uh, there was not this law, I would not <laughs> retire. <laughs> but anyway, uh, at least I'm emeritus professor, so I can still use my office and do mm -hmm. research at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. I'm also uh, participating, uh, have a strong collaboration with the uh, Institute for Quantum Science and Engineering of the University of Texas A&M in the United States. And, uh, and this is very interesting also for providing an interaction between the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and Texas University. So this is my uh, professional condition. And my mandate as president of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences goes up to the beginning of, of May. I'm very happy to have now uh, an excellent replacement uh, in the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Uh, I have been you know, in the board of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences for 18 years. Wow. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I think it's time to, uh, to have other people keep the flag. And, and this is going to happen in the beginning of, of, of May. So uh, again, so, Congratulations on this workshop, and, and I, I'm sure it will be an excellent opportunity for exchanging ideas and making advancements in science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Davidovich, for your kind words. And now I have the honor to invite Professor Paulo Piccioni, the president of the Brazilian Mathematical Society. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, I want to say that um, Professor Luis Davidovich said that he had a double position in this uh, meeting today as a member of the TWAS and the uh, uh, Brazilian Academy of Science. And I am happy to say that I have a triple position here, in fact. In first place, uh, as president of the Brazilian Mathematical Society, let me tell you that, of course, as you know, Brazilian Mathematical Society is one of the sponsors of this, uh, of this meeting together with our colleagues uh, at Tian and uh, yeah, of the Latin America and the Caribbean Regional Partner of the World Academy of Sciences and the um, Mexican Mathematical Society and the uh, Brazilian Academy of Sciences. So as president of the Brazilian Mathematical Society, I have to say once again that I was very uh, enthusiastic to support, to give our support to this kind of meeting because, um, because um, in first place, because of uh, excellence of mathematics, 
of course, the sec and also for um, the reason of uh, gender and geographic balance, which uh, the organizers have always tried to uh, maintain. And these are very important points for the society. So I, I was very enthusiastic to uh, give our support to this meeting. Um, the second uh, role that I have in this meeting is that I belong to the scientific committee. And uh, as a member of the scientific committee of this, um, uh, of this event, I want to thank first my colleagues in the scientific committee, of course, and second, all the speakers and uh, uh, the moderators who accepted our invitations. Um, your names were selected uh, with great enthusiasm by all of us. And uh, we are very happy that you accepted our invitation. And the third role that I have in this meeting is that I am a differential geometer. So I'm particularly eager to attend the conferences that will be given in this seminar. And uh, I really look forward to hearing all of you uh, speakers um, who have uh, very kindly accepted uh, our invitation. So let me conclude by thanking all the participants uh, the TWAS for supporting this group of young people and uh, the young affiliates who have taken this initiative, the members of the scientific uh, committee and uh, all speakers today. Thank you very much. And I wish success to the event. Thank you very much, Paolo, for your kind words. And uh, now I have uh, uh, the honor and the privilege to invite Professor Franco Cabrerizo. He's not here, but uh, he recorded a video. He is the chair of the executive committee of the TIANS. Professor Morenci, Professor Davidovich, Professor Dickestein, and Professor Picone, distinguished speakers and participants. It gives me great pleasure to say a few opening words on behalf of the To Us Young Affiliates Network, Tian, and to welcome all of you to this fantastic workshop. As part of the, as, as the chair of Tian, but also as part of the organizing committee, I can say I was a direct witness of the fast and solid growth of this workshop. It started during the pandemic, with what it would be only a webinar, one webinar. And now after four or five editions and due to the great effort done by Jacqueline, Ferran and Eduardo, I can say that this is not only a project, but, but a concept. A strongly supported by international organizations and by a group of outstanding scientists that are part of the scientific um, community. Ken is very happy to see that through these particular activities, we are more than achieving the Tian's vision, that is a world connected by scientific cooperation, and also the Tian missions aimed at catalyzing interdisciplinary research among the members. Uh, certainly, Tian will continue to support all the upcoming, and you can come with that, with, with that. Once more, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to both the organizers and the scientific committees. They have been working together since the beginning of the planning stages, and certainly a special acknowledgement to our honorable speakers. I can truly appreciate your dedication. I'm convinced that this uh, will be a very fruitful event for everybody, so enjoy, enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now I have the honor to give the word to Professor Alicia Dickenstein. She is member of the scientific committee. Alicia. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. So I'm very happy to welcome all of you again, even if we already have those nice uh, welcoming messages from all my colleagues. Um, and I'm very happy that we have this good energy and drive from the organizers from Tian. And also I would like to welcome everybody in name of the scientific committee. Paolo is one of the members. The other members are Carlos Kenig, uh, Maria Jose Pacifico who is here, 
and uh, Renati Turriaga from Mexico. And we have a fantastic pool of young and senior uh, speakers from different parts of Latin America. And I think that, and we also are, are going to have these lectures in the framework of uh, two excellent moderators from uh, Italy and the US. And I think that it's one of the good things that the pandemic has brought to us is this idea of having these collaborations and well, it's not the same as being in person, but just being able people from different places of the world who maybe cannot travel because of money or work reasons. And we can join, we can share, and we can learn and we can listen and we can try to work together. So again, thank you very much for being here and I'm looking forward to the lectures. Thank you very much, Alisa, for your kind words. And now I have the honor to, to give the words to Professor Ferran Valdez. He's member of the organizing committee. So Ferran, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, I only have one minute left, so I want to be short, but let me go straight to say that I want to thank, uh, first of all, our speakers and moderators for the time invested uh, in this workshop. <clears throat> also for their patience, because uh, sometimes we had to change plans. Uh, it's not easy to organize this kind of uh, workshops. I also want to uh, thank again our wonderful scientific committee for their time and also for their patience. And also my dear colleagues that uh, Eduardo, Jacqueline, um, Hernan and Franco have been doing an amazing job putting all these things together so we can be here today. This being said, and now that the game is afoot, let's begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Feha. So with that, we close this opening. And now I invite uh, Professor Barbara Nelly to start with uh, our meeting. So Barbara, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. And um, thank you to all for the nice words. Um, it's an honor for me to be here and uh, start in, by introducing uh, uh, Professor Katie Tannenblatt. Um, she does not re really need a presentation. Um, she is one of the forever young as we told before, in my opinion. And um, she, I, I just uh, say something uh, about, uh, about her, only a few part of his uh, wonderful career, of her wonderful career. Um, she got her PhD uh, at IMPA after being uh, uh, in, after studying in the US and in Brazil. Um, and then she, after her PhD, she became a professor and she had a wonderful career from the scientific point of view and also for, from the point of view of her responsibilities. She was, for example, president of the Brazilian uh, Mathematical Society, maybe the first uh, woman, this I don't know, but uh, anyway, she was one of the few women that was the president of the Brazilian Mathematical Society, if not the only one. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she was an editor of um, Mathematica Contemporanea, that is an, uh, 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 I would say, um, um, traditional, traditional uh, uh, review, mathematical review of Brazil. And uh, she had also some, uh, um, some uh, uh, honor from, the, the, from the, the state of Brazil, like Comendador and things like that. So, and finally, what I would like to mention is the fact that she had a very, very important role in the development of differential geometry in Brazil because she had 29 PhD students. So this is really something that's important. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I talk uh, even uh, too much because uh, it's important to leave her the stage and the Katie will talk to us about um, the following subject uh, on the self-similar solution to the curvature flow for curves. So please, Katie. Thank you very much. Uh, 
for the introduction, very kind introduction. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the organizers and also the members of the scientific committee for the invitation. Uh, so it's very nice to be in this Tian meeting, talking to young and uh, forever young people. <laughs> so I'm trying, I will put up my presentation here. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll talk on the self-similar solutions to the curvature flow for curves. I will start talking a little bit uh, on, about the curve shortening flow and then uh, tell you about some known results on the plane, uh, for curves on the plane and then for curves on the sphere, then on the hyperbolic two dimensional space and then on the light cone. So let's start here with the definition of curve shortening flow. This is a one parameter family of curves, XD on, usually you start with a Riemannian manifold, two dimension manifold with a metric G. And we say that this family is a solution to the curve shortening flow with a given initial condition, which would be an initial curve on the manifold. If the derivative of this family X with respect to T, it's equal to the geodesic curvature of the curve at time T times the normal vector field of the curve N and you of the curve at time T. And then you want at, at T zero, the family of curves to be exactly the initial curve X. So trivial solutions for such a problem would be the geodesics since the curvature is zero you can always define xt to be equal to x, the initial curve, and then this will be a trivial solution for this problem. So you're not interested in this kind of uh, solution. No? Now I'll tell you some of the results uh, for the, uh, when the manifold is the Euclidean space. So uh, Epstein and Gage show that if you consider the initial problem that you wanted and you add up tangential components, then the result is geometrically the same, meaning that up to a diffeomorphism, you will get the same uh, solution. So we can define the curvature, the curve shortening flow to be a one parameter family of curves that satisfy this inner product of the derivative of xt to t times the normal t equal to geodesic curvature of the curve at time t. Now the word curve shortening flow is justified because when the curves are closed, then it is a gradient type of flow for the arc length functional. So usually it decreases the length of the curves. Okay, now when the flow evolves by isometries and homotities, then the initial curve is called a self-similar solution to the curve shortening flow. And whenever the evolution is just by isometries, then you call it a soliton solution of the flow. A, the simplest example would be the Grim Reaper on the plane which is the graph of this function log of cosine, and it evolves by translations. And it was proved by Giga that this is a unique curve of the plane that evolves by translations. Another example is the yin-yang spiral that evolves by isometries on the plane. Uh, Ambrush, Langer, and Epstein and Weinstein, they investigated closed curve, not necessarily simple, that evolved by homotities. And Halderson, more recently, he completed the description of all self-similar solutions on the plane. Gage showed that closed curves on the plane evolve into circular curves after a certain time. This is reasonably, I mean, it's expected because they are decreasing the length. And Gage and Hamilton showed that convex closed curves collapse into a point. Uh, moreover, eliminating the, uh, the convex condition, but assuming that it's closed embedded curve, then they evolve to circular curves and then they collapse into a point at a finite time. Now, Anginen showed that under some general condition, the curve, the curve shortening flow, it evolves in some sense into a self-similar flow, showing the importance of such solutions. 
Okay, so now if we consider an ambient space different from the plane, Halderson, he classified all the subsimilar solution on the Minkowski plane. He showed that this is not a gradient type of flow, that the soliton solutions may have finite Minkowski length without having endpoints. And some results for this curve shortening flow for Riemannian manifolds different from the plane were also obtained by Chen and Zhou. Now I'll tell you about the soliton solutions, meaning the solutions that evolve only by isometries on the unit sphere. And this is the joint work with Yuri Dos Reis. So we consider a non-geodesic curve parametrized by arc length on the sphere. We are considering the sphere inside the three-dimensional Euclidean space. And this non-geodesic curve is a soliton solution to the curve shortening flow if and only if there exists a non-zero vector of the Euclidean three-dimensional space such that the inner product of the tangent vectors field with the vector V is equal to the geodesic curvature of the curve X. Without loss of generality, we can consider that this vector V, so up to isometries, I can always consider that the vector V is on the vertical directions. So it would be a a multiple a times this vector 0, 0, 1, where e is a is positive, then one can see that this geometric characterization is equivalent to saying that the functions alpha, tau, and nu, which are given defined by considering the inner product of initial curve with this vector e, the tangent vector field with e, and the normal with e, it has to satisfy this Dif system of differential equations. So the, the constant A is in here in the system. And you want the initial condition at t equal to zero to satisfy alpha square plus tau square plus eta square to be equal to one. So this geometric condition is a, that characterizes the soliton solutions on the sphere is equivalent to solving this system of equations with this initial condition. Now, by studying the solutions of the system, one obtains the following theorem that describes the soliton solutions on the sphere. For any non-zero vector of the three-dimensional Euclidean space, there is a two-parameter family of non-trivial soliton solutions to the curve shortening flow on the sphere, and the curves are defined in all real line. Now the two ends are asymptotic to the geodesic on the sphere, I'm uh, uh, calling the geodesic gamma, and this geodesic is orthogonal to the vector v. Now whenever the length of the vector is between zero and two, then the curve will intersect the geodesic gamma at infinitely many points. If the length is bigger or equal to two, then the curve will intersect at the, the equator, the gamma, at most on a finite number of points. Moreover, one can show that each end of the curve converges to gamma without self-intersection. I can show you here, uh, visualizing here, some of the soliton solutions on the sphere. So the vector is vertical. The length of the vector in this example is 0 0.5, and it has infinitely many intersection points with the gamma. Gamma is the equator in red. And the ends, they are converging to this equator. Here, the length of the vector is 1, still has infinitely many intersection points. The theory tells you about those critical points of the curve alpha, of the function alpha. Here the vector has length two and it still has, it has at least one point of intersection. It cannot have more than a finite number. And for V equal to three, it seems that there are no intersections with the geodesic. So now let's go to the soliton solutions to the curvature flow on the hyperbolic space. This is a joint work with Fabio da Silva. In this case, we will consider the hyperbolic space contained in the Minkowski three-dimensional space with the, vector, with the metric uv, the inner product, with coordinates u1, u2, v2, 
three, you three being minus u one v one plus u two v two plus u three v three. So the first coordinate is the one that has the negative sign here. So one can also show that the curve shortening flow in the hyperbolic space is geometrically invariant if you add up tangential components to the equation. And it is also a gradient type of flow for the arc length functional on the hyperbolic space. Now, in order to state the results, we consider X to be the regular curve in the hyperbolic space, parameterized by arc length. So T will be the tangent vector field, N will be the product of X with T. And the geodesic curvature of the curve is given by the inner product of the derivative of the tangent vector field with the normal vector field. So we will say that this is a curve shortening flow. So a one parameter family of curves is a curve shortening flow with initial condition x if the inner product of the derivative of x with respect to t times n is equal to the curvature, geodesic curvature at time t. This inner product now is the inner product of the Minkowski space. And you want x hat at t equal to zero to be the initial curve x. Now, soliton solutions of this uh, flow on the hyperbolic space, this will be a one parameter family of solid of solutions. And we will say that the curve, initial curve X is a soliton solution if the, this curve evolves by isometries, meaning that I will consider this one parameter family of curves obtained by applying an isometry M of T on the initial curve X. Now, MT will be a one parameter family of isometries of the hyperbolic space. And at T equal to zero, it has to be the identity map. Now, an isometry of H2 is an element of the Lie group O13 that preserves H3, H2, the hyperbolic space. Here we have this uh, geometric characterization of the soliton solutions on the curve shortening flow on the hyperbolic space. And it tells you that this soliton solutions is equivalent to the existence of a vector, non-zero vector in the Minkowski space, such that inner product T with V, so the tangent vector with the tangent vector field with the vector V is the geodesic curvature. I'll give you the proof of that so that in order, this is the only proof that I will give it, which is the simplest one, but it tells you how you end up finding this vector V in this case, at least. So you're starting with a family of curves that are obtained by applying an isometry to the initial curve. And you are assuming that this uh, system of differential equations is satisfied. So if you impose this condition to this family the way it was defined, you find out that the curvature at time t will be m prime tx and in the product with mt applied to n. So considering t equal to zero, you have that the curvature is m prime at zero times the x in a product with n. Now, because m prime of zero is an element of the Lie algebra, one, three, so you consider this basis a1, a2, a3 of this Lie algebra, then m prime zero is a linear combination of these bases. So you have those three constants, c1, c2, c3. And you just compute the curvature will be m prime, oops, my goodness. Oops, oops, oops what's going on here? I'm sorry, I, hmm? Okay, <laughs> so uh, so the curvature is given as follow, and uh, so m prime because it's given as a linear combination of those three matrices, it turns out that the linear product is equal to t times this vector c one plus c two c two and minus c three. So if we take if we take the vector v to be this vector here, then we end up showing that the curvature is 
inner product of t times this vector v. And the converse, assuming that we have such a vector with this property, then without loss of generality, because the vector v is on the hyperbolic space, you can have th three kinds of vectors. It's time-like, light-like, or space-like. So you can consider that v is up to isometries of the hyperbolic plane, you can have that V is a multiple of one of those three vectors as depending on the type of the vector V. So you can, the curvature will be given by K equal to T times VI. Now VI is a multiple with A positive. And so we, have, we need to prove that we have an evolution by isometries. So how do we define this evolution? Ac depending on the type of the vector, if it is a time-like vector, we consider this family of isometries, which is given by cosine and sine of a times t. If the vector is light-like, then we consider this family of isometries and apply to the initial curve. And if the vector is space-like, we consider this family of isometries of the hyperbolic space. And then one computes by defining this way, we compute a derivative of actual respect to t times n. And you find out that this inner product, it's t times the initial curve, the vector tangent to the initial curve, a times w, which w depends on the type of the curve. But anyway, we are assuming that this is equal to k of s. Yeah? However, because we are evolving by isometries and isometries preserve geodesic curvature, so this means that this is the same as the curvature of the curve at time t. So this means that x is a solid on solutions. So this is how the vector appears. Now, uh, we, will, we can show that this geometric condition corresponds to obtaining solutions of a system of ODE. We start with the curve on the hyperbolic space. We consider those three basic vectors of different types. So the first one is time-like, second light-like, and the third one is space-like. For each one of those vectors, we consider the, the functions alpha, which is the product of x with e, tau, which is the product of the tangent times e, and eta, which is the product of the normal vector field with e. So the curve x parameterized by arc length is a soliton solution to the curve shortening flow uh, in the hyperbolic space, meaning that there exists a non-zero vector such as the curvature is the product of t times v, if and only if the v, the vector v is a constant time, one of those vectors, a positive, and the functions alpha, tau, and eta, they have to satisfy the system of ODE given as follows. So alpha prime should be tau, tau prime is a times tau eta plus alpha, here is the constant a appearing, and eta prime is minus a times tau square. And the initial condition at zero should satisfy minus alpha square plus tau square plus eta square at zero should be minus one if i is equal to one, zero if i is equal to two, and one if i is equal to three. By, because this alpha tau and eta is a solution of this system of equations, the expression minus alpha plus tau and minus alpha square plus tau square plus eta square is constant for all s. So if you start with initial condition minus one, this function will be equal to minus one every, for all s uh, or zero or one, depending on the type of the vector. Now, how do we relate the solution of the system to the soliton curves? So assuming you have a curve, a solution, alpha tau eta of a system like that, with one of those initial conditions at zero being minus one, zero, or one. Now, how do we get the curve? Once you have the solution, 
you define the curvature to be eight times the function tau. Then this should be the curvature of the curve. Then once you fix the curvature, there is a curve on hyperbolic space whose curvature will be k. And this is defined up to isometries of the hyperbolic space. So one can choose the t and n at the initial or x at zero, t and n at zero, such that this is satisfied, this relation between alpha, tau, and eta, and the curve are given at zero. And one can show that this happens for all s. So this is how you get the curve. In each case, E is one of those three vectors, and you get, you get one of the three types of soliton curves. Now, in this figure here, you can see the geometric, uh, the geometric uh, interpretation of the curve alpha, of the, of the function alpha. Alpha, now here we have the upper, upper half hyperboloid, and here's the curve X of S. Alpha would be the Euclidean distance between the points of the curve and the plane orthogonal to 0, 0, 001. Here, alpha over square root of two is the distance between the points of the curve and this like like plane. And in the case of the vector is a space like vector, then alpha is the distance between the points of the curve and this plane. Now, alpha, tau, and, and eta will give you the geometric properties of the curve. So uh, as we saw, the soliton curves, obtaining the soliton curves correspond to obtaining the solution psi of s given by alpha, tau, and eta of the system of ODE with, for each constant a and initial condition psi of zero given in one of those disjoint sets. Now each solution is defined on a maximal interval i, and it, once you consider the initial condition in one of those sets, psi of s will stay on the set for all s. Particular solutions of those solitons are those for which the function tau is constant. Uh, why are these important? Because when tau is constant, the curvature will be constant because the curvature is a times tau. So one, if you have a solution where tau is constant, the curvature of the curve will be constant. Now, uh, if psi of s is a solution defined on the maximal interval i with initial condition psi of zero belonging to one of those three disjoint sets, then tau of s will be a constant b if and only if this psi of s is in the third set. So psi of zero has to be on a, in s. And the interval of definition is the whole real line. And the constant b can only be minus one, zero, or one. In the case b is equal to zero, then psi of s is the singular solution of the system. And actually, because b is equal to zero, this the geodesic will be zero. So this means that the first case is when you are dealing with the geodesic, is a trivial solution. Whenever b is equal to plus or minus one, then the constant a has to be one. Psi of s will be of first degree in s, so the curve will be in second degree in s. And this is these are also planar curves for which the curvature is constant plus or minus one, and we will call these trivial solutions. So by studying the properties of the ODE system, one can prove the following theorem. For any ve non-zero vector of the Minkowski space, there is a two-parameter family of non-trivial, meaning non-constant curvature, soliton solutions to the curvature to the curve shortening flow on the hyperbolic space. There are three classes of solitons determined by the type of the vector V. Now, a series of lemmas will imply that each solution is defined on the whole real line. So the maximum uh, interval of definition is the whole real line. 
At each end, the curvature tends to a constant, which is minus one, zero, or one. And moreover, one can show that this soliton solution is an embedded curve in the hyperbolic space H2. Each of those uh, properties, geometric properties, they follow from studying the critical points of the solution, alpha, tau, and eta, looking at the, oh my goodness. I don't know why. What I happens, have... Kathy? I don't know. It's, got, it's something. Oh my goodness. My my. Maybe I have to get out and come back. You know. Ah, uh, because you are you are stuck. Your your video is stuck. Is that? Yeah, I can. Yeah, you you also don't see my. No, I, I see the the same uh, the same uh, slide as before. The. Oh, so it stopped, you mean, you stopped? Yeah. yeah. Maybe you can try to uh, stop sharing okay, and then... Fine. Yeah, no, I, I returned to the sharing. Okay, it's okay now? Okay, so as I was saying, can you see that? I can Hello? see the same slide. Try, try to change the slide. No, okay, okay, good. No. <laughs> sorry. Ah, yes, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. All right. I'm so sorry. So uh, I want to, you to visualize some of the soliton solutions on the hyperbolic uh, space. So in this figure, what you see is three different models of the hyperbolic plane. Here is the hyper, hyperboloid. This is the Poincare ball. And this is the upper half space model for the hyperbolic space. Now, this is the same curve, soliton solution for V, being a time-like vector and the constant a to be equal to one. So the ends of the curve, they go to, inf to the boundary, as you can see in any of those uh, visualizations. So this is a soliton when the vector v is light-like, the three models, and this is a soliton solution whenever the vector is space-like and the constant A is equal to one. Okay, so now I want to tell you about the curvature flows for curves on the light cone. Uh, I just want to mention that I'm not talking about curve shortening flows on the light cone because as we will see soon, these are not always uh, curve shortening flows. So the, 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 the length does not increase or decrease always. But it has very interesting properties. Now we define the light cone to be the set of uh, light-like vectors of R31. And uh, once you consider a space-like curve in the cone parameterized by arc length, then you have three vectors which characterize such a curve. The ve position vector x, I'm considering again the cone inside the Minkowski space. Then you have the tangent vector field, T. And now we have a, another uh, vector field, which is Y of S, which is defined as follows. This is the unique light-like vector field such that Y and T is equal, they are perpendicular, so it's zero. And X and Y, the inner product is equal to one for all S. Now, how do we define the curvature for such a curve? If you take the derivative of the tangent vector field, this will be expressed in terms of the position vector x and this, this vector field y. The coefficient of the vector field x will be called the, is the curvature, and here the coefficient is minus one. Now the K of S measures, the curvature measures how much the curve bends from being a parabola. The parabola will be the trivial case where it's a geodesic, the curvature is identically zero. If the curvature is constant B and this constant is positive, then the curve will be a hyperbola. And if the constant is negative, <clears throat> then the curve is an ellipse. We will call this curve y of s as associated curve to x. Now, if the starting curve 
has a non-vanishing curvature, then y of s is a space-like curve and its curvature is one over k of s. Okay, so now we will start looking for this uh, vec the flows, but because we have the cone has two connected components, the upper half cone and the lower half cone. So I will just, uh, because without loss of generality, we will consider just the upper half cone. The same thing holds for the lower cone. But I observe that if x, x is a space-like curve on the upper, upper cone, then y of s is a curve on the lower cone. So if we take minus y of s, it will be a curve on the upper cone. So now we will consider two kinds of flows. One of them is called the curvature flow and the other one is the inverse curvature flow. So this is a family of space-like curves on the upper cone with initial condition a given curve x and you want the derivative of x respect to t times now the vector, the vector field y of t is equal to the curvature of time t the initial curve had to be at t equal to zero, it has to be x given initial curve. And this is the inverse curvature flow. You want this inner product to be minus one over kt for each t. Now, y of t, this family is a light like vector field associated to x of t. So when X is a parabola, we have a trivial solution of the first problem because you can consider just X of T equal to X for each T. And this would be the trivial solution for the curvature flow. In the second case, you cannot have curvature vanishing. So you don't have this kind, but we will see we have other different trivial solutions, okay? Now, why do we consider this one over k problem? Now, there has been an in increased interest for curves in R2 that evolve by a function of the curvature, not necessarily the curvature. This has occurred since Husken and Ilmanen used the inverse mean curvature flow to prove the riemann penrose inequality for certain three-dimensional manifolds. Now, why I'm mentioning this, because the for example, the higher dimensional generalization of this curve shortening flow, if you consider surfaces, for example, in R3, the equivalent problem would be the mean curvature flow. So uh, here, because of this, um, this application of the inverse mean curvature flow, so people started looking for uh, flows in which the, the inner product, instead of being the curvature, but it's a function of curvature. For example, Urba studied one over K alpha in the plane, Andrews investigated K alpha divided by alpha, and the minus one of K in the plane was studied by Drugen Lee Wheeler, and they studied those curves that evolved by translations. Minus one over k also was studied by Andrews and he showed that the only simple closed curves on the plane that evolve by homotopies are circles. Now we have a result that tells you that those two flows, they are related. Now assume that x is a space-like curve in the upper cone and y is the associated curve to x. Now we consider x hat to t to be a family of curves evolving by a, from x whose curvature never vanishes. Then you have a y hat t associated curve to x t. Then one can show that the family x t is a solution to the curvature flow with initial condition x if and only if minus y, now here the, it's minus t, that's because we want to be on the upper uh, cone, is a solution to the inverse curvature flow with initial condition minus y. 
So in the, in the cone, studying the curvature flow is equivalent in a sense to the inverse curvature flow whenever the initial curve of the curvature flow does ne never vanish. Now we will study self-similar solutions to the curvature flow and also to the inverse curvature flow on the half cone, meaning that we want the curve X to evolve by homotities and or isometries and to satisfy the curvature flow or the inverse curvature flow. So what does this mean? We want to evolve X as follows. We can apply function F of T, a positive real smooth function. And then we consider here a family of isometries of the cone. And then we will apply this to the initial curve X. So f of zero has to be one, and the isometry m of zero has to be to the identity, so that when t equal to zero, you, you recover the initial curve. I just recall that isometries of the upper cone will be elements of O13 that preserve the upper cone. So one uh, so first, a pro uh, special properties of those similar, uh, similar functions, self-similar solutions, are those that evolve just by homotities. This means that the evolution x of t is equal f of t times x, where f is positive and f of zero is equal to one. Then one can show that this family xt is a solid solution of the curvature flow if and only if the curvature is constant. f of t is given explicitly in terms of this constant k and t, and the curvature at time t is equal to k divided by 2kt plus 1. In particular, when k is negative, this constant is negative, then you have an ellipse of curvature k, and this is an ancient solution, meaning that the t evolves from minus infinity to minus one over two k. And this family x of t collapses into the origin of the Minkowski space at t equal to minus one over two k. When the constant k is positive, then x is a hyperbola of curvature k, and it is an immortal solution with j starting in minus two over k, and going to infinity. Now, uh, an observation is that the curvature flow on this upper cone is not always a curve shortening flow. And this we already had seen before. Uh, this was proved also in the Minkowski plane by Halderson. And when you can see that in fact, if X of S is an ellipse, if you take this homotity evolving curve, then the arc length of the curve decreases. However, if you start with a hyperbola and you take the same kind of evolving curves, then the length will increase along the flow. So this is not a short curve shortening flow. That's why we just call the curvature flow and inverse curvature flow. Now uh, we have a similar results for the inverse curvature flow. If you start with homotities, then we have the family of uh, this evolving family will satisfy the inverse curvature flow if it is case constant. F of t is given explicitly like that. And the curvature is 2t t plus k. In particular, if we start k negative, you start with an ellipse. This is an ancient solution starting with minus infinity up to minus q over two, and is expanding from the origin of the Minkowski space. If the curvature is positive, then the curve is a hyperbola of curvature k. It's an immortal solution starting with minus k over two and going up to plus infinity. So as a corollary of these results, we get the following characterization of the, the only closed curves that evolve by homotities along the curvature flow and along the inverse curvature flow are the ellipses. So these are the only closed curves 
evolving biomodities, and they are ancient solution and collapse into the, into the origin along the curvature flow, while they are immortal solution and expand from the origin along the inverse curvature flow. Now, once uh, in this case, we also have a characterization of self-similar solution to this curvature flow in terms of <clears throat> vector V. So assuming I start with a space-like curve parametrized by arc length S, then this will be a self-similar solution to the curvature flow on the cone, if and only if there is a non-zero vector and a constant C such that C plus this inner product between T and V is equal to the curvature. And the, in the case C is equal to zero, then we have soliton solutions, meaning they, they just have uh, isometries and not homotities. Similarly, for the inverse curvature flow, we have a similar characterization. There is a non-zero vector and a constant such that C plus this inner product of T with V, the tangent with V is one over K of S. Now, uh, uh, we observe that a parabola and an ellipse or a hyperbola is a planar self-similar solution, uh, meaning that it, it uh, has this property trivially because it's, they are planar curves. So there is always a vector V such that T inner product with V is equal to zero. So in the case of the curvature flow, if you choose C equal to K, this will satisfy this geometric characterization. In the case of the inverse curvature flow, you just consider C to be E1 over K and then the ellipse and the hyperbola will satisfy this characterization. So this will, call, will, will be called trivial solutions of the curvature flow and of the inverse curvature flow. I'm stuck again, oh my goodness. You seem to have two pages that are equal. Mm. Ay, ay, ay. So like this one, yeah? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they are all the same. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I, I think I have to stop sharing and come back again. So okay, okay. Let's see now. Oh, it doesn't. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's oh, the same. Yeah, yeah. But the, you, you see, you may you see the the other pages or not? No, I don't see them. That's ah. why. Oh my goodness. So sorry. I will stop sharing and this is the problem when there is no blackboard available. <laughs> this is a... Back to meeting, let's start sharing again. Oh my goodness. I am in the meeting, right? Can yes, you see yes. me or no? Yes, of course. And we could also see your slides, but just uh, it was the same page again and again and again at the end. I mean, it was... Uh... Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe it's Adobe Acrobat is the problem? Probably, no, but let's see now. Yeah, Can I... Sorry, sorry. Okay, Sometimes you, now. you do for squeeze, yeah. Okay, let's see now. 42. Okay. <laughs> ah, so, that's uh, good. I... Thank you. This one, yeah. Okay, he, I was here, right? 
I guess so. Correct, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. We were talking about the trivial solutions. Okay. Now let's see. Uh, uh, let, we are going to characterize these solutions with systems of ODE, as we did before. We consider one of those vectors, E1, E2, and E3, being those time like, space like, and no, sorry, time like, light like, and space like vectors. We consider those three functions. Alpha will be the inner product of X with the vector E, tau, the vector T with E. Now, in this case, different from the previous cases, Eta will be the inner product of the vector field Y, this associated curve, with the vector V. So the self-similar solutions of the curvature flow, which satisfy this condition, they are equivalent to the following. The, the vector V will be a constant A times one of those vectors. And then the functions alpha, tau, and eta will have to satisfy this system differential equations. Now the initial conditions are quite different. They have to be two alpha eta plus tau square at zero. will have to be minus one, zero, or one, depending on the type of the vector. This function here is uh, constant for each uh, S, for all S. And we have similar solution, similar results for the inverse curvature flow, where this term here, instead of being this, is 1 over C plus A times tau. Now, by studying the this system of ODEs, one has the following properties of the of these soliton self-similar solutions. Now for any non-zero vector of the Minkowski space and any constant C, real constant, there is a two parameter family of curves, which are non-trivial self-similar solutions. In the case T equal to zero, these are solitons. There are three classes of such solutions depending on the vector V. The curvature function of the, of the curve X has at most two zeros. At each end, the curvature is either unbounded or it tends to one of the following constants, C or zero. And each curve minus Y associated to X is a self-similar solution to the inverse curvature flow and it has at most three connected components. So I want you to visualize some of the, I have two minutes. <laughs> Uh, I will show this uh, visualization of those self-similar solutions. On the left-hand side, do you have the cone and you have the curvature flow? These pictures initially, they are going to be a soliton solution, meaning C is equal to zero. Here you have the curvature function, which has one zero. And so the, the associated curve why is it has two connected components because here there is one zero here you have two connected components of the inverse curvature flow in this case here this is a, a light like vector the curvature doesn't have any zero so here is one connected component while here is one com uh, the inverse also has one component observe that here the interval of definition is not the re whole real line it can have many different situations. Here, this is a space-like vector. The curvature has two zeros and you have three connected components in the inverse curvature flow. This is a, now this is not a, a soliton anymore. This is a self-similar solution. The constant C is minus one fourth and the curvature is going to this constant minus one over four. This goes, uh, it's asymptotes a, a circle, and here also. Now, the part, uh, what you're seeing here is the negative curvature part, because the positive curvature part is so far away that you, the cone would be too big to put it together. <laughs> now, this is a very nice um, self-similar solution. It's obtained for C is equal to minus two and A equal to one half. So this is a self-similar solution to the curvature flow. It, what happens is that when the curve, when the limit is going to plus infinity, this is going, this is going to an ellipse contained in a light-like uh, plane. 
And this is the one part of this part here of the inverse curvature flow. And I will finish up with this one, which is a self-similar solution here of the curvature flow. The curvature has two uh, zeros, one critical point because we chose it like that. And you have three connected components of the inverse. If you choose differently the constant C and A, you can have here different uh, laces and here you would have the num number, the bigger number of critical points. So I guess this is it. And thank you very much and sorry for the interruptions. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, as we are late for technical reason, uh, first of all, I, I know that uh, there is a, a question and answer session at the end of the two talks. So uh, please keep your question for a moment, for a while, and then we will continue with question for both. And now I think that we, uh, as we are late, maybe we give uh, one minute uh, uh, break and then we start with the media. So uh, one minute break, just one. Barbara, can you hear me well? Or Ferran? Hola, Emilio. Sí, te puedo escuchar muy bien. Bienvenido. Muchas gracias. gracias. Hola, hola. I'm sorry. I was I was speaking with the, my microphone uh, mute. So no, it's okay. I, I wanted to check the mic. <laughs> yeah, you can also you can also uh, start uh, try try to share if you want okay. uh, to 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 try it as you like. I mean. Can you see it? Uh, probably in a while because I, I see that you are that you started the screen sharing, but I don't see. Still don't. Let me try see. again. Let me try again. Yes. No. Yes, wonderful, okay. So in fact, one minute, one minute is left, so uh, we can start. And it's a, it's a pleasure to, to introduce um, one of the young of this, uh, of this uh, Congress, on this, of this workshop. Um, in, he is uh, Emilio, I hope to pronounce it well, Laurette or Lore. I don't know. It depends on. In Argentina, it's Lauret. Lauret. Okay, per perfect. <laughs> As Argentina is a, is a, is almost a part of Italy, so it's Lauret. <laughs> Emilio is clear for. <laughs> okay, so um, Emilio Lauret. Um, that, uh, in spite of being young, he has uh, many. He has uh, already a uh, very. A large career. He got his PhD uh, in the University of Cordoba in uh, 2011, so he's very young. And um, he, then he got um, um, a very important uh, postdoc position that is a Humboldt Fellowship, is a, is a very important one. And then he started to work in Argentina and he's still a professor in. Um, at the University of Nacional del Sur in Bahia Blanca. Um, uh, he got also uh, some prizes and among them, uh, I think that maybe the most important is the Von Stimulus Award in 2020, very recently. So uh, of course, he's a differential geometer and uh, he will talk uh, to us about uh, Isospectrality among homogeneous Riemannian manifolds. So please, Emilio, the stage is for you. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara, for the kind presentation. Uh, and also, thank you for, for, for inviting me and uh, for being here and for the organization to Ferran. 
the idea of the talk is a kind of, of survey talk about uh, inverse spectral geometry and spectrality, but in the context of homogeneous Riemannian manifold, which is a very restrictive uh, condition. Uh, and well, let's see, it's a, it's a survey. Let me introduce some of the, of the notions. We will take a, a Riemannian manifold that will be assuming compact, connected, and without boundary, okay? Uh, and this object has always a distinguishable second order differential operator, the Laplace Beltran operator, or, or, or Laplacian for friends. And we, we care about its spectrum. Okay, we are going to be interested in the spectrum of this operator, but not on the on the not on the eigen eigen functions. Okay, only about its spectrum. Okay, what is the spectrum? It's a collection of eigenvalues, like any matrix. You know there are eigenvalues that might be repeated or not. Well, this is a differential operator that shares a, a lot of these uh, uh, properties is self-adjoint. So the eigenvalues are not negative and actually the eigenvalue series is actually one and the rest are positive and so on, okay? And, and the question, when we have here the question, can one hear the shape of a Riemannian manifold? It's kind of a, a funny way to describe this because uh, the, 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 the article that popularized inverse spectral geometry from the 60s was written by Mark Katz that the, the title was, can one hear the shape of a drum? In this context, a drum means a, a bounded plane domain, okay? In, in the plane, in R2, a bounded domain. Uh, and, and the physical interpretation of the spectrum is roughly speaking, that the, the spectrum encodes the information of how the drum is going to sound when somebody hits, okay? Roughly speaking, that's the idea. Uh, but in, in this case, we are talking about bounded domains, so they, they have boundary, so it's not in the context of this, of this talk. But uh, of course, as is very usual in mathematics, we generalize everything. So we are talking about here in Riemannian manifold. Okay. Uh, two, two, two Riemannian manifold are core isospectral if the spectra coincide. Okay. And, and well, the idea is uh, this we cannot distinguish this Riemannian manifold by hearing the sound that they produce. Okay, we cannot distinguish, but might be different or not as a geometrically speaking, okay? Uh, this is a, the idea of this, of this area, to, to try to see what kind of geometrical or topological properties are encoded and determined by the spectrum, okay? Uh, so how much these kind of properties are called audible? Audible, or we can hear such a property, for instance, the volume. We know that uh, one can compute the volume or the dimension knowing only the spectrum, okay? So we can hear these properties. But the idea is there are not many of these spectral models, okay? Uh, and well, there are, plenty of, of examples of isospectral, but not isometric examples of Riemannian math. Okay, that means that uh, the, the isometric class is not, one cannot hear the isometric class. But there are no many examples in the context of Riemannian math. But now we uh, review what means. A Riemannian manifold is called homogeneous if the isometry group acts transitively on it. Okay, this is a, a, a Lie group, which is compact because M is assumed compact. Uh, and well, this is the definition means roughly that if you have two points in, in the manifold, there is always a global isometry, global isometry that takes one to the other. 
And I wrote many things here. You, you can read it, but it's not my intention to, to, to read for you. But the, the main idea is that Lie theory, in the sense of compactly groups, because here is M is assumed compact, compactly groups and Lie algebras play the fundamental role it, because many geometrical or, or, or also analytical objects can be written in Lie theoretical terms which are sometimes simpler objects and one can compute many things, right? That's uh, the, the idea of, 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 of how this subject works. For instance, uh, for instance here, the, the differentiable manifold is written as a quotient of compact group or the tangent space, another geometrical object is corresponds, is identified with some certain subspace of the Lie algebra and so on, okay? Uh, and in particular, for instance, the, the Ricci tensor can be written in, in Lie algebraic terms and also the Laplace, okay? Which is an analytical, quite important and very difficult operator. Well, also, also can be written in this way. Uh, so let me, Talk about examples, I suspect are examples of homogeneous Riemannian manifold. Okay, we'll restrict to homogeneous Riemannian manifold, and there are no main. But the first very example, very first example of uh, isospectral non-isometric Riemannian manifold where I where flattori, which are homogeneous. Okay, these were constructed by Milnos in, in the 60s, and they were 16-dimensional flattori. Okay, but uh, if we, uh, and there were subsequent examples of lower dimension, okay, until like mentioned four. Now I suspect a flat top. This is a problem more related with the number theory, with the quadratic form, right? Um, uh, but beside this example, the next homogeneous isospectral examples were constructed by Dorothy Schutz many years later. Uh, and she she constructed a many isospectral deformations, homogeneous deformation. But more precisely, there, there are continuous curve of left invariant. Now that these manifolds are already compactly groups. And a left invariant matrix, roughly speaking, means that this, this Lie group, any Lie group acts on itself by multiplying at the left, right? And left invariant metric is a Riemannian metric such that this action is by isomers. Okay, that's that's roughly the idea of what is a, a left invariant. Metric. Uh, are there a question? Okay. Um, well, she she construct this uh, isospectral homogeneous deformation, which means that the spectrum doesn't depend on T, okay? It, it stays the same, but something, some, th this doesn't matter what is this, but the idea is this in, implies the non isom okay? It's, they are pairwise non isom Okay, the, the main tool used was the, the Torus method that was developed by Carolyn Gordon and Dorothy Schud, and, and, and these examples were extended by, by Proctor in 2005. So let me proceed with the next examples. Uh, the Peche Sunada Satan's construction, but first let me recall what is the Sunada's method bracket. This is uh, the most famous example, uh, method to construct isospectral manifold. Most of the isospectral examples are constructed using this method. And the method works as follows. Pick G a finitude. This is very important. Finitude, okay? Finitude. Acting by isometry on, on this manifold, on this Riemannian manifold, and pick two subgroups, which are assuming almost conjugate. Almost conjugate means that there is a bijection between the elements of these two groups, such that the, the 
conjugate classes on G is preserved. This bisection preserves the, the, the conjugate class. Of course, if this bisection is a morphism, they are conjugate. And, and conjugate always implies isomer. Okay? So the idea is to, to find this almost conjugate, by, but not conjugate sum. Okay? Um, and well, uh, given this, uh, this pair of subgroups, these manifolds, another proof that these manifolds are isospectral. Okay, here the metric is the only metric uh, induced by G. Okay, uh, are there questions so far? Are you hearing me, by the way? Yes, yes, we are okay. hearing you, but I, I suppose there is no question for the moment. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, Craig Sutton extended this method to G a continuous group, because you may see here that if you are quotient by discrete subgroups, this will be usually, if, if, F, if M is homogeneous, this will be locally homogeneous, but not necessarily homogeneous, okay? So he Saturn extended to G a continuous, more precisely a compact group. Okay, so the, the here we have more or less the same the same hypothesis as by isometries, and here we have something else. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter what means a generic stabilizer, but the idea is that if we have two subgroups like here, two subgroups of G which are K equivalent. This is the, uh, the condition analogous to almost one, okay? Actually, uh, this, this K equivalent is because Peche, and this is why the, the method is in this name, Peche generalized to another method by recurring something weaker than almost one. Okay, something weaker, which means K equivalent. Uh, this, this condition is equivalent to representation equivalent and K equivalent is something uh, weak. So it is more general. And, and this version, Pese, Pese Sunada's method, generalized here for continuous. This is what Craig Sutton did, okay? This, these are more, um, more general assumption in order this has sense, in order that what we obtain are really manifolds. But uh, the, the thesis is, is what one expects, okay? The, the analogs here. One, one obtains uh, isospectral manifolds, okay? And well, Saturn used it to, to, in the case of M equal to G, okay? In order to obtain manifolds of the form G over HI, so they are homogeneous one. And, and well, uh, he obtained isospectral homogeneous manifolds of very large dimension. You see, this is the smallest dimension we constructed, so it was not easy at all to, to study in details any of these examples. But, uh, and you do, using exactly this method, they prove that these two homogeneous manifolds, here is the, the healing, the healing metric, the, the standard metric, right? The, the one in use it by the healing form of, of G. These homogeneous manifolds are isospectral. They are not isometric of dimension 26, but moreover, they were able to prove that are not homeomorphic to, are not homeomorphic. And they are simply connected. So if they are simply connected, they are they are self a universal cover, right? And this this was the first example that shows that the universal cover is not audible. Okay, one cannot hear the universal cover of, of a manifold because these are isospectral, but the the universal cover are non homomorphic Okay, so the, the this was a the first example of this, okay. Um, okay, let, there, there are 
no more, almost no more examples of homogeneous, I suspect there are homogeneous manifolds. So from now on, we are going to be interested on the lack of isospectral, or, 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 or in other sense, whether the Laplace spectrum distinguish man, okay? Uh, and well, in general, not necessarily homogeneous, one, one may expect that very special Riemannian manifolds like the brown spheres or symmetric space or something like this is distinguishable, spectrally distinguished. Means that if some other Riemannian manifold is isospectral to, to one of these, then they are indeed isometric. Okay, this this one may explain. But the 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 true, well, the, the, the in practice, it it seems that it is extremely difficult to prove something like this. And and for is, for instance, this is the, the the most the strongest result in this direction. And the this this result say that the Brown's sphere of dimension at most six can be spectrally characterized, okay? We, we still don't know whether the seven-dimensional round sphere can be or not isospectral to another Riemannian map, okay? This shows that this, this, this problem is extremely difficult. So the people usually restrict the space of map, do not try to distinguish some manifold among all Riemannian map. And, and the restriction we, we pick in this talk is homogeneous, homogeneous Riemannian. Okay. So here are some natural problems. The first one is, well, more or less the same. Try to find some homogeneous Riemannian manifold that is spectrally characterized or spectrally unique within the space of homogeneous Riemannian manifold. But still, this is uh, quite difficult. I don't know. Uh, this is this is quite good. So let, let's go to something more more simpler and pick a symmetric space. Okay, this again this is has a very special geometry. Uh, and and the idea could be to prove that among homogeneous metrics on the same underlying differential in manifold, whether uh, this is spectrally unique, okay? If you pick any other homogeneous metric here, isospectral to the symmetric metric is because they are indeed isometric, okay? This is the question. Uh, and the third question is for fixed homogeneous manifold, uh, to, to check, to prove, to, to study whether there are or not G invariant metrics, which are isospectral, but not isometric. G invariant means more or less the same as, as, as before with left invariant metrics. If you multiply by the left, if, if G acts naturally here by multiplication at the left, well, this G invariant metric satisfies that this action is by isometric. Okay. So let's. Let's uh, study this second question, what is known so far. Remember, we want to distinguish via the Laplace spectrum, the symmetric metric among other homogeneous metric on the same manner, the same underlying. Manner. Of course, uh, Thanos uh, result, it was quite general, so it, it responds affirmatively with this for these cases. And it is, the, the question is trivially positive for, the, for some irreducible symmetric spaces where the only symmetric metric up to motosis is, is it, okay? There are no many other. For instance, the, the, the even dimensional spheres and many irreducible symmetric spaces of rank two. Not everyone, but me. Okay. Um, uh, it is also it is also true for compact rank one symmetric spaces. Okay, this was recently proved by Renato Vettiol and, uh, and Paolo Piccione, 
Paolo uh, Piccione, the, the, the member of the scientific committee, so it is a fourth reason to, to, be, to be present as a co-author. Uh, but this is a more general result that I will talk in the, in the next slide. Uh, so it is, it is already now this, this question in many cases, but there is a very difficult case, which is the irreducible symmetric spaces of compact type. This means take a compact group and the bi-invariant metric if you endow this compact group with the bi-invariant metric, this is a symmetric space. So it, it can be seen as here as a symmetric space, but uh, it, this bi-invariant metric is in particular left invariant metric, and all of all of these left invariant metric are homogeneous metric. And, and this space is, is quite wide, it's, it's very large when the dimension of a group, okay? So it, this is a very difficult case. Um, it is solved, of course, for, for SU2, because this is diffeomorphic to the three-dimensional sphere. Uh, um, but, uh, but not for any other compactly group of dimension greater than. Uh, and well, Carolyn Gordon, Dorothy Schutt, and Craig Sutton prove that this symmetric metric, the bi-invariant metric, is spectrally isolated here. Okay? Remember, this space is very large. It's not easy to distinguish something here. But they were able to prove that it's isolated. It means that there is a neighborhood around the symmetric metric, the bi-invariant metric, such that no one other metric there is isospectral to, to the bi-invariant metric. Okay, it's isolated. Um, and well, it, it turns out that for, we, we said that this is very, very large, but it turns out that for this very special group, SPN, this, the, 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 the Lie algebra is the classical algebra of CN type. Uh, it was possible to prove that it's spectrally unique. The bi-invariant metric is spectrally unique here because it was possible to prove that the multiplicity of the first eigenvalue of the bi-invariant metric cannot be equal to the multiplicity of the first eigenvalue of a left invariant metric, which is not bi-invariant, which is not bi-invariant. I am not claiming that we know an expression for the first eigenvalue of any left invariant metric. I am saying that the multiplicity of the first eigenvalue is always strictly less than the multiplicity of the bi-invariant metric, okay? Unless the, the metric we pick is bi-invariant, okay? Uh, and well, this, this moment is, is, I think, good to, to announce a, a a project in collaboration with Juan Sebastián Rodríguez from Colombia. We are dealing with the irreducible symmetric spaces of non-group type, not of this type, which has some other homogeneous metrics. Okay, uh, these are two families plus two exceptional cases, and we want to to prove to. to answer this question, but also a more general question that we are going to talk in, in the next slide. Uh, so I'm not sure how much time I, I have, but this is the, the last slide. Uh, this problem, remember, we fix an homogeneous manifold, and we want to know whether two G invariant metrics are isospectral, if they are isospectral, whether they are uh, isometric. And uh, this is a more general question, right? Because before you have one very special one, the, the symmetric metric or the round metric on the sphere and so on, and you want to distinguish for the rest. But here you have a big set, of, or you have a set of metrics, and you want to check that two non-isometry metrics are non-isospectral, are not isometric. So it's a more general question. 
Um, Benjamin Schmidt and Craig Sutton proved that in, in SU2, any two left invariant metric, or the same SU2 invariant metric, are isometric if and only if they are isospectral. Remember, this is the three street. The, the, the result can be, can be written as two homogeneous metrics on the three sphere are isospectral if and only if they are isometric. Okay. And this was an unpublished result that now was currently was included here, a uh, joint sampling. But this paper studied a much more general question because they, they are interested on locally homogeneous three mine, locally homogeneous, okay? And, and it's a very nice, uh, Problem: They want to hear the first on geometry of a, of a locally homogeneous free manifolds, but because it's locally, they, 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 they focus on, on locally homogeneous. They, it is not present anymore in this this talk. But uh, this result is for homogeneous and, and was included here. And, and there is a. a, a an alternative proof here. Uh, and well, recently with Renato Vettiola and Paolo Piccione, we were able to prove that pick, pick two uh, compact rank one symmetric spaces. This means uh, the spheres of projective spaces. Okay. Um, and pick two of them, possibly different. And we, we pick two metrics, homogeneous metrics on each of them, okay? And we prove that these two metrics are isospectral if and only if they are isometric, okay? There are no isospectrality among homogeneous manifolds on compact rank one symmetric okay? This is the, the result. That's what I say that it, it is more general that to, to spectrally characterize the a symmetric metric is because we are characterizing, we are distinguishing any metric in the Laplace okay. uh, And well, that's all. Thank you very much. Um, um, here is a reading suggestion. Uh, yes, reading suggestion is a notice article by Craig Sutton that consider much more of what we have done here and even more because he, he wrote a lot about the local homogeneous manifolds. So I, I strongly recommend them there. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilio. Uh, so you, uh, you are perfectly in time. So uh, now uh, we have the questions and answer session. We have 20 minutes more or less. And uh, I, I propose to, uh, to take the first 10 minutes for Cathy and uh, the second 10 minutes for Emilio so that we are not mixing uh, video <laughs> up and down. So Cathy, please uh, switch on your, your video if you are here. And uh, okay, and Emilio, you can keep your video on, of course, it's uh, at least a week and stay on. And then uh, um, if a participant have a question, please go ahead, um, raising your hand or uh, opening your microphone. We are only 30, so you can open your microphone and uh, ask if you, if you want. Um, I'm not sure if someone is... Hello, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. You can also switch on the video if you want. <laughs> I, yes. So we can see you. <laughs> okay. So I have a question. Uh, first of all, thanks for the very nice thoughts, both of them. But I have a question for the first one. Um, can we do something similar um, on a pseudosphere in the Minkowski space. So you you describe solitons in the hyperbolic space, in the light cone, and I wonder if something similar can be done in the pseudosphere. 
Thank you. Well, probably you can. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is uh, quite recent, the way we, uh, we are dealing with the problem. So what we are doing is uh, changing from one uh, two-dimensional, I mean, we dealt with, um, with uh, space forms, yeah? So one can certainly cha change the, the, the manifold, two-dimensional manifold, and start looking at the curves. It seems that there is, I mean, uh, so you have to deal with ODEs. So you expect to have ODEs. So I, I would say that you should be able to do it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um... Uh, anyone has uh, some uh, some observation or remark? Um, anyway, waiting for more questions. I have one question. Uh, uh, it, it's very it's very interesting. You you take curves in uh, in a two dimensional manifold, so and you study them. Then of course uh, we know that there is the mean curvature flow. You also mentioned it, so it's uh, any uh, all the time in co-dimension one, anyway. I was wondering if you take a curve in a manifold of dimension three, for example, uh, may you do something? May you say something about well, that? Okay, so some, some results, there are some results on this direction. Uh, so, but uh, what happens is that the co-dimension is bigger than one. Mm -hmm. So people have dealt with the Euclidean case, I mean, some results. And for example, they considered uh, just if the evolution goes by translations, then they end up that there are no new curves. It's actually the Grim Reaper, uh, equivalent to the Grim Reaper. Let's say you could think of a, of a cylinder because the plane is isometric, locally isometric to a cylinder. You can just... Uh, Tra transport also the Green Reaper from the plane to the cone, to the cone or to the to the cylinder. So they ended up finding that there are, if you're just dealing with trans translation, then you don't have any curves. You're if you are dealing with dilations or so motetes, then the solutions are plane curves. So you go back to the to the R two. Uh, but there are some uh, other results when you involve the uh, rotating, uh, I mean, the evolution being with rotation, they have new uh, examples. And uh, the technique is uh, completely different from this one. You're just uh, dealing with the system of equations with the, uh, the curve itself, you know? Mm. There are some, some some results, okay? Okay. But just okay. in Euclidean in Euclidean space, and, and there is no characterization as the one you have. I mean, you have a, a, a complete characterization not, not, in some sense. Not this kind, but they have. Uh, s s uh, if you assume that you have rotating and translations, you can have an a, a second order system of of these. Let's say. And then you have to, to deal with them, etc. It's not like this one that you have those, the, because the difference is that in this case, what we are dealing with the sphere and the hyperbolic space and the light cone, you in, in a set, especially with the sphere and the hyperbolic space, what you're dealing is with the, like a frame a frame for the curve in the space mm. that you are in. So it's a kind of, uh, uh, a different way of dealing with it, You're using the ambient space. Yes. In other case, so it's, it helps a lot, let's say. Of course. But and I have a, a, a much simpler question about uh, an example. Um, in the light to cone, you have ellipses, okay? Also ellipses. And uh, yeah. which is the case that, for, I, I suppose that among all the ellipses, there is the circle. So, which on is the, the case on the cone, on the light cone? So, which is the case that give you the circle? No, no, this is asymptotic to, to a circle, but it's not a solution. The only 
the the closed solutions would be the I mean if you taking you're taking with homotities you have the ellipses and the uh, and the uh, where was that you you're talking about the the light oh, cone right? the light the cone light, let's see if we get there. So the, the unique closed, uh, that's, okay, you have the parabola, the ellipse, the hyperbola, and these are trivial solutions. And you have one here, which is a asymptotically. That's, I guess this is the one you want to see. Uh, I'm sorry. This, this one here, you are going asymptotically to this. To the uh, circle. Yeah, asymptotically in both directions, but these are not uh, not uh, soliton solutions or self similar. This is asymptotically going to something. Okay, okay. Thank you, Kathy. So, uh, any other questions for Kathy? I think that I don't know if I see, I don't see raise it and so I think that we are done we thank you again very much Kathy uh, for the very nice talk it was very nice to see you <laughs> again so uh, now it's time to uh, to ask question to Emilio so please go ahead switch on your microphone or camera and you can you can ask. I can ask something to you. <laughs> it was a very it, it was very nice for the moment. I asked. Then someone else maybe is uh, is coming. Um, it was a very nice talk. I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's not uh, a subject that I know. Uh, above all, the, you need it. The, yeah, the, um, the inverts problem, in some, I'm more accustomed to uh, discover something on the spectrum, knowing something of the geometry. So it's, uh, it's different. And I, and I was wondering, at a certain moment, you uh, mentioned the fact that if you have some uh, assumption, geometric assumption, for example, on the curvature and so on, maybe you can ask uh, if, uh, isospectrality implies uh, isometry, and there was, but I don't, I don't, um, I didn't see in the talk cases where, for example, assuming constant sectional curvature, then you have some uh, uh, some properties or some results. Well, th this is one example. Okay, the, when we say yeah. round spheres, well, th this was the only one. In fact, I. Um, so, but, but that's the point. Even assuming constant curvature for the round sphere, which is a very strong assumption, right? The spectra, uh, geometrical speaking is very special. We don't know much about uh, this case, okay? There, there is no, it is not possible. So, so maybe here I did, didn't understand correctly the, 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 the theorem, <laughs> maybe. Because so, um, mm, it's really you take a round sphere and it is characterized, but you, you already have a round sphere. So, yes. So, yeah, yeah, of dimension n um, less than, at, at uh, six. than c. At most six, it's, it means that we still don't know whether a seven dimensional round sphere can be or not isospectral to another Riemannian model. We still don't know, okay? And, and constant curvature, constant section of curvature is a very strong assumption. Even okay, so so please, so if you take a, a manifold that has a constant sectional curvature of dimension seven, with a yeah. some some uh, I don't know compact or something I don't know if you take some some other property. No, no but compact is necessary. Compact, so compact. Uh, constant sectional curvature, simply connected, or, 
or not, or not yeah? You, you have also this, and you don't know if it is a, a round sphere. Uh, okay, no. You, you don't right. know whether there can be or not some Iso other manifold with non-constant sectional curvature isospectral to. To that. It, this is not known. Okay, this is not known. And something else that it is known that is that if you have two manifolds, two isospectral manifolds, okay, and, mm -hmm. and uh, isospectral, and one of them, this has constant sectional curvature, mm -hmm. and the dimension of M is at most six, then the other one has constant sectional curvature. This is no. Okay. But not, one cannot say they are isometric because there are indeed a spherical space form, means the, the round sphere quotient by, by finite groups acting freely. There are of this kind, isospectral, but not isometric. Okay. Okay. So in this case, the topology makes the difference. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I see. Ah, it's very. Uh, the the yeah. examples are uh, lens spaces, and yes, yes, they are not not homeomorphic. And uh, yeah, so it, it's already at the level of topology. And uh, so, in higher dimension, the things are better. It seems to me, for yes. all those examples, are one knows. So in yeah. low dimension, it's it's more difficult. That's strange as well. I mean, it's, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, no, no, low, low dimension is, is, is simpler. I mean, for, for dimension. No, uh, okay, just for the, yes, but just for simply connected. Uh, in, in the case of the sphere, okay, but. Uh, okay, but we are not assuming homogeneous in this case, and, and no, uh, in higher dimension, in principle, this is, is more difficult. Yeah, no, I was thinking about the examples that you gave at the beginning. Ah, yes, yes. In, in the, order to give examples, is yeah. yes, in higher dimension, is. is so in is, higher dimension, you already know that there are more examples yes. that are isospectral, but not isometric. So it's easy in this sense. I mean, you have a, yes. you have example, contrary, contrary yes. example. Yes, yeah, that's true, that's okay. true. But there exist isospectral surfaces, okay? Even in dimension two, there exists isospectral hyperbolic surface. That are not isometric. That are not isometric. So in every obvious dimension, not one of course, but in every dimension there exists isospectral, not isometric Riemannian model. It's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> it's really a mess. So very that's interesting. Why, that's why it's, it is interesting, right? Of course, of course. No, it's a, a mess, a, an interesting mess. <laughs> it's really interesting. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, so could I ask a question? Of yes, course. Christina. Yes, yes. If you have a sequence, uh, are there sequences of isospectral manifolds or are there theorems known about sequences of them? Ah, oh, you're interested in sequence. Nice. Very nice. Uh, and, and what means a sequence? You, what do you assume about isospectrality? All of the member of the sequence. Every member of the sequence is isospectral to the other one. Are there compactness theorems like saying that they have to converge or? Um, there is a there is a theorem, but only in dimension two. Only in dimension that two. That the space. Of, of isospectral of, of of a set of isospectral matrix must be compact. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is no, and it's a very strong result, but in dimension two and in higher dimension, it is not possible to say much. At least so far, nothing has been done. But but again, you you when you talk about sequence, you are assuming that. All the members of this sequence are isospectral, or they are approaching spectral. No, they're all okay. isospectral, but approaching would be interesting too, of course. Okay. But okay. Suppose they're all actually isospectral. Yeah. Uh, there, there are examples, right? Because we have a uh, shoot examples here. Let me show you. 
these are these are continuous codes. Okay, mm -hmm. so th there might be, but I'm not sure whether one can say something about the limit or not. Okay. I think it is open whether you can ensure that if the limit exists, have to be I, I suspect or not to the to the set. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there is some other question. Um, I have one uh, short question, if I can. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, Emilio. How are you? Uh, I was wondering a couple of things about this result of Tano that uh, it goes up to dimension six and then it doesn't work anymore. If there is any short reason or something that one can understand why it's just up to dimension six and then it doesn't work. And it related yes. to, to that same point, if uh, there is some characterization in the direction of that, if the spectrum is close to the spectrum of the six sphere, somehow there is the, the money for the metric is close to the, to the wrong sphere. Uh, the, the first question, it can be answered by, by the method. The Tano use and, and many other people use the, the so-called heat invariant. Heat invariant is, roughly speaking, some numbers. Uh, they are spectral invariants, and they are. I'm not sure how can I explain without technicality. I guess you know what means, right? Heat invariants. Yeah. The, the asymptotic of of the. Of the Trace of the kernel, um, and well, uh, they use this to, to to prove to prove this. And the first heat invariant is roughly the volume. The second is the scalar curvature, and the third one is a combination of three things. One is the the, the norm of the one is the, the the square of the scalar curvature. Another is the norm of, of of the rigid tensor, and I mean there are three three things, and when you assume when one if is is has constant sectional curvature, this uh, these expressions simplify in, in some sense, okay? Um, and when since you have the the quality of the four, not three, four or first heat invariants you can obtain some conditions to, to the other one. And it turns out that you can ensure the, the isometry, but only when n is less than or equal to c. It's something that changed when, when n is, is at least seven. But I don't remember the detail, uh, but something changed that it, it is not possible. And, and it has been open so far, okay? It is now, it, it also Tano proved that in, in any dimension, uh, you can spectrally distinguish locally the, the round metric, okay? The round spheres, there is a neighborhood around all the metrics in, of the round metric that there is no any other isospectral example inside, okay? So locally, you can spectrally distinguish. Uh, and again, with the heat invariance and, and something is simpler because you are assuming that your the metric is, is close to the round, round metric. That is more or less answered your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that uh, we start to be late. So if there are no more questions, uh, we thank Emilio again and Cathy again. And uh, I, uh, I think that we can recover at, uh, now I will do some confusion about the hours, but I think it's 1.20 uh, uh, p.m. That's it? Please, that's organize. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's correct. You're correct, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to you. And bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> Bye bye. So yes, we resume at uh, 20 past the hour. Now it's 12 past the hour. So we have an eight minute break.
And I think I see Jimmy and Raquel already here. Hola, Jimmy. Hola, Raquel. Hola. How are Hello, you? Hey. So your moderator will be Professor Cristina Sormani, which is I'm here. Right here. Hola, Cristina. Yeah. So I leave you with her and thanks for being here in the background. <laughs> Hi, Jimmy, do you want to test? Uh... Yes. Uh, well, they're sharing the screen, I guess. I only need to. Are you going first or me? Uh, you go first, I think. Oh, OK. Hi, Raquel. I don't Hello. See Hi. Hi. Are you sure Raquel is going first? On the I poster, so. it looks like Jimmy's first, but and then let me just double check on the uh, schedule. It is uh, Raquel first. Yeah, I at first I thought that Jimmy was first, but then today I check again the schedule. No. And me first. Okay, so should Raquel, I try you're first? To... Um, yeah, so should I try to share or maybe? Yeah, you, you can try to share. You can try to share that. Mm, okay, so how do I do this? Mm. Connect your iPhone or iPad to this computer. Okay, trust. It says you started sharing. Just give a little mm -hmm. time there. It appeared. Okay. okay, that was easier. Then I have to do this. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So how is teaching in person, Christina? I'm not teaching in person. Ah, okay. Still, no. <laughs> but, but I think you told me last week that you were going, maybe you went to the grad center or something. Oh, um, I was supposed to go to the grad center for a meeting, but um. actually right now my nephew and my sister both have COVID. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, <laughs> they, they are, they do have the booster. So um, it should be okay. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I couldn't go because I, I shouldn't. Um... Yeah, I see. Good. Good. <laughs> I mean, you, I you are... okay. It's good. Yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, the problem is that they went skiing. Mm -hmm. And in New York City, we're doing all right. Like our peak passed. We had a really high peak again about a month, the past month. And then they went skiing and they went to Pennsylvania and that's a red state. And so nobody wears masks and nobody has shots. Mm -hmm. So that's probably where they caught it. I mean, but you don't have it. You don't no, have I don't have it. it. You, you are just, just being very precautious, which is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they don't, we have the, um, the New York alert that if you've been uh, within six feet of somebody, mm -hmm. then you are get um, classified as a, um, you know, supposed to stay away from other people. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think I, I, I actually gave myself a test and I'm negative, mm -hmm. but, um, it's, it's, it's good for the sake of uh, safety of the city. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
three more minutes. Yes. Now my phone is dying, but my iPad is okay. And how many minutes do we have? Is it 40 or 50? <sighs> okay, just a second. Yes. You have from 1120, they, they let you pretty much go until the next speaker. So it was closer to 50 because they did the, the questions at the end, at right? the end of both. Mm-hmm. But if it seems to me that if you finish early, then uh, we can do questions right, right. away. Okay. I, yeah, I think questions right away is a little easier for people to still focus. Yeah. So you don't forget them. I don't know. I, I but I don't want to break rules. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you also have questions in the middle, you can interrupt. Oh yeah, we can, we, you can you can say that at the beginning of your talk. Yeah, don't worry, Christina. If you break some rules, I mean, <laughs> I'm a very obedient person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not not in the past, but somehow it, it, it's 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 come this way over time. I don't know. Yeah, but you know, these workshops are some sort of jazz <laughs> sessions, so yeah. you feel feel the vibe, and if you feel the vibe, like there's questions to be addressed, and just, yeah. Um, by the way, the next speaker is, um, uh, in the program, we had Jimmy instead of Raquel. I don't know if... I don't know, I so think, that's I weird. That's I have a cool. version of the program where Raquel is next. So what is the final version of the program? I think they are two different schedules. Okay. Let me see. I have one that says Raquel 1120 and Jimmy at 1210. I saw Raquel first. Yeah, that's the one. That okay, saw. so my bad. <laughs> are you can... No, but if there's been a newer schedule released. Yeah, so let me check with my co-organizers, which are here. What is the most recent schedule everyone's been sent? Yeah. Because actually mine was set. I ha- I don't have a recently sent schedule. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Are you there? <laughs> yes, uh, I think in my program, it's also Jimmy, actually. <laughs> so then yeah. let okay. me stop sharing. I can. Okay. Um... Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Speak up Jimmy, on. Raquel, and I all have the yeah. older schedule. <laughs> Speaking about breaking rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really breaking rules now. But I, I, I just, I, I know that my schedule is from a long time ago. We can do it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, Break, that, breaking the rules, right? Little... <laughs> no, breaking... that, that should be breaking a rule, I guess. <laughs> no, breaking out rooms. We can have two, two separate rooms. Exactly. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but there is only one moderator, so we can. So should I share my screen then? Yeah, yeah. Practice sharing your screen. Yeah. Okay. Let me just check. Will, and then I announce you because it's okay. basically time now. Let me just uh, check. Is everyone right? back yet? I just want to make sure that participants are around. Yeah, they are here. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, you're Argentinian, right? I actually, I am American. I was born in Connecticut, but I ah. uh, grew up in Argentina. So uh, something that you can tell from my accent. My <laughs> father was Argentinian. I, I just remembered you as, I don't know if you remember me. I seen that I met you, yeah, we but I each don't other remember when. Years. Back in, when you were in grad school. Oh, really? I, I saw that, yeah, and I know you, but I didn't remember from work. Yeah, 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 because I was at NYU when you were at Sunny Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> good so to anyway. see you again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that but was some time, way, quite some Argentina. time ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, so I wasn't sure, you know, nationalities yeah. have changed up over time. <laughs> yeah. Okay.
<laughs> Those were good times, though. But yes, man. yes. <laughs> All right, so I guess it's time. Um, shall I start on time? Please go ahead. Yes, okay. So I, I'm... Uh, I'm to introduce Jimmy Patean, who was uh, who has his Licentora from uh, Licentora from Argentina, uh, Buenos Aires, and uh, his doctorate is from Stony Brook University. He did uh, research on um, Kähler geometry, Kähler Einstein manifolds, Yamabe invariance of simply connected manifolds, minimal entropy, and collapsing with curvature bounder from below. So I'm delighted to hear him speak now on the Yamabe invariant and the Yamabe equation. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Christina, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for Ran and all the organizers for the invitation to give this talk. Um, so my idea is to kind of give a survey of uh, one of my, probably my favorite topic, which is uh, related to Yamabe invariant and uh, my, uh, most recent work is mostly about the Yama equation and finding multiplicity results for the Yama equation. And, uh, but uh, the idea is to, to do some kind of a survey of the whole thing and uh, so, so kind of start talking about the Yama invariant and try to uh, motivate uh, some questions about the Yama equation and multiplicity results on the Yama equation. Uh, of course, feel free to make questions uh, throughout the talk. And, uh, Okay, so uh, let me start. Uh, I will first talk about mostly about the Yamabe invariant. Uh, as I said, as kind of a way to uh, motivate the discussion about uh, the Yama equation and solution of the Yama equation. But they are, of course, very much related. So let me just fix the setting. We will have, uh, we are going to work with closed manifolds. The dimension is going to be at least three. Dimension two is a nice story, is the motivation for the whole thing, but uh, the techniques that one uses uh, only work for dimension at least three, and it's going to be clear a little later. G will always be a Riemannian metric. We're going to do some work only with Riemannian metrics. So the question, the first question that appears is, is uh, if the existence of conformal metric of constant scalar curvature. So you fix your metric G, you look at the, uh, conformal class of metrics, so the metric G multiplied by some positive smooth function, and you wonder if there is a metric in the conformal class which has constant scalar curvature. This sounds a lot like uniform, uniformization theorem in, a, in dimension two. This is kind of a generalization of that. And the equations first appear in this way, in an article by Yamabe in 1960, this is kind of the beginning of the modern story of the equation. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so, and, uh, finding a metric constant scalar curvature in a conformal class is the same as solving this, which we call the Yamabe equation. The equation that appears some constant an, this is some dimensional constant, Laplacian of u, SG will always be the scalar curvature the talk, lambda is supposed to be a constant, u to the p minus one, where p is the, you know, p minus one is the critical sobel exponent. So p depends on n, this is number two n over n minus two, and is the, the exponent in the sobel inequality in Rn, and that makes a, a, a big story about the technicality of the, of the equation, but uh, we are not going to enter too much about that, I'm just mentioning it. So, and the point is that if you look at you, you look at your conformal class, your conformal metric, you write it as u to this power p minus two times g. This is the function f. And if you compute the scalar curvature, you will get a formula which depends on u and g, of course. So the formula is precisely if you move the u to a p minus one to this size, this is going to be the scalar curvature of the conformal metric. So if you solve this equation, the scalar curvature of u to the to the p minus two times g is going to be whatever you put there. In this case, a constant lambda. This is so. So finding a metric constant scalar curvature is solving this uh, nonlinear PD. This is kind of the linear part of the equation. It's called the conformal Laplacian, and this is the nonlinear part. Um, 
the first observation that there is going to be clear that is just to mention you you can see that the lambda actually you can uh, since you have a linear part and this is non linear you can uh, uh, multiply the metric or the function by a constant you can change the lambda within the same sign if you can always put lambda equal one zero or minus one and it's actually a fact that you can in conformal class you can only solve the equation for one of the signs uh, this is going to be come back later so we we'll just mention it here and the main point that precisely when the, the story started it was by uh, Yamabe was this uh, observation that the Yama equation is actually the Euler Lagrange equation of the Hubel Einstein functional or total scalar curvature functional, which is this, it's just integrating over the minor for the scalar curvature. You divide by some power of the volume to make it scale invariant. Then uh, you restrict this uh, Hilbert Einstein functional to a conformal class. So you apply the, the functional to a metric in the conformal class, which we write it again in this way, u to the p minus two times g. And then of course you will have a formula for this in terms of u and g. And if you do it, you will obtain this, uh, this equation, this uh, formula. One calls this the gamma functional. And, um, and you can see more or less is the, the Euler-Lagrange equation of that functional is the, the gamma equation that I wrote before. So the first uh, thing that uh, appears is this uh, yamma constant, which is the infimum of this, uh, of this functional restricted to the conformal class. This is a constant, uh, which depends on the conformal class. Sometimes this is called the yamma invariant. There is some uh, different notations that uh, are very common. So I will call this the yamma constant. Um, it's very easy to check that it's actually bounded be below because this now this part is positive and then you have a uh, we are in a closed manifold so where g is bounded below you, if it's positive then it's of course this whole thing is uh, uh, greater than or equal to zero if it is negative you take the infimum and then you have some uh, Schwarz inequality between the internet of u square and integral to u to a p and it's very easy to check that it's bounded below so this is a finite constant the yamma constant um, and i will get back to this when i talk about the yamma equation itself but uh, let me um, continue with this uh, talking about this yamma invariant so once uh, we define this yamma constant which were the infimum of uh, of the Hilbert functional in the conformal class, and then we define the Yama invariant as the supremo over the family of the conformal metrics on the manifold. So uh, this also has some different uh, names. I mean, it was introduced by Kobayashi and Rick Shane more or less independently, in 1990 something, um, with different names. Rick Shane called it the sigma constant of the manifold. Uh, Again, you still have a different uh, notation, mu invariant sometimes. Um, okay, but we'll call the uh, Yama invariant and the supremo. So you will see which is the idea. It's just uh, um, to do some mean max procedure over uh, the Hilbert Einstein functional. Uh, supposedly, if you kind of realize that, you will get an Einstein metric. Uh, and the idea is this is kind of some uh, geometrization scheme on the manifold. Uh, the original idea of Yamaha is supposed to be that she was trying to solve Yamaha uh, point uh, conjecture uh, doing this and to find a metric, uh, an Einstein metric on a, on a simply connected C manifold, but uh, he only worked on the first part of the, of the problem. The second part of this supremo is kind of the most difficult thing. Um, Okay, and the, the next observation is uh, by Theory of Van, which is actually, I wrote that the Yama, this Yama invariant is bounded by, this is the Yama constant of the round metric on the sphere. And I said that this Bn is the volume of the N sphere, and this number is precisely the Yama, fun, the Hilbert Einstein functional evaluated in the sphere, so just the integral of the scalar curvature. You obtain that, and then so this, what this is saying in particular is that the round metric on the sphere realizes the infimum uh, of the Hilbert function is conformal class, and it's a bound for 
the YAML concept of every conformal class on any management. So in particular, uh, this is telling that the YAML invariant of the sphere is realized by the round metric. Um, okay, um, so uh, another point is that you can check actually more or less easily that the YAML invariant is positive if only if the manifold means a metric of positive section, uh, scalar curvature. So this is, I mean, the, the YAML invariant is positive means that if a conformal class that uh, uh, has positive YAML constant, it's easy to check in that case that uh, you have a metric of positive scalar curvature. The problem of whether a manifold not admits a metric of positive scalar curvature is very classical, so it's not, but it's a very difficult question. And that tells something that uh, the complexity of the invariant and, um, and also that uh, the YAML invariant in positive or non-positive is very, is very different. I, I wrote a, a phrase uh, at the end, but essentially it says uh, the non-positive case is simpler Two fundamental is that um, in the non-positive case, you have only one metric of constant scalar curvature in the conformal class. So, and we'll, again, we'll get back to this later. Um, so what do we know about the YAML invariant? You, you can understand that it's very difficult to compute or to say strong things about it. So let me just give a very brief uh, summary of what we know. First, what I was saying, dimension two is another story. I mean, this is a uniform, uniformization theorem that uh, tells you that in the conformal class, you have metric of constant curvature. It's only one curvature in dimension two. But the, the whole scheme that we are doing of this, of minimizing of a conformal class, the, the total scalar curvature functional, and then taking supremo doesn't work at all because the total scalar curvature functional in, the, in dimension two is simply constant by class one. So there is nothing to do there. So we have to work in dimension at least three. Dimension three is uh, where the Ricci flow works, essentially, or the geometric flows in general, I would say. So uh, in particular, this is uh, the work of uh, Perelman for the Poincaré conjecture, uh, the, the, the geometrization conjecture. And this, what he, what he does, works uh, perfectly well to compute all the YAML invariants actually in dimension three, when precisely in the non-positive case, it's kind of the simpler part. And essentially saying that uh, the invariant is realized by uniformization. Uniformization uh, tells you that uh, in the micro you will really be able to evaluate the geometric pieces and uh, this realizes the YAML invariant essentially. So in particular, if you have a hyperbolic manifold, the hyperbolic metric realizes the, the YAML invariant in dimension three. Already for the positive case in dimension three, you, you don't know much. There is only this uh, work by Bray and Neves, which, who proved that uh, could compute the YAML invariant for the three-dimensional projective space. And it is realized by the metric of constant sectional curvature. Um, and then uh, you can uh, do some extra work and prove actually the same computation for uh, uh, connecting sums of RP3 with copies of S2 times S1. And this is about everything that uh, could, could be done in the positive case for the YAMA invariant. For all other uh, lens spaces, mm, we don't know. So in dimension four is uh, where cyber within theory appears. Kind of uh, each low dimension has its own story. So with cyber within theory, a lot of computations could be carried out. Uh, I mentioned a few which were computed by Claude Lerun uh, around 1997, I would say, but not exactly. And that I mentioned a couple of result ones. For instance, the, the second one that I mentioned is for minimal complex, comp compact complex surface of general type, you can compute it. And the, the number I, 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 is written explicitly of the chart number there. But uh, in the case of a minimal compact complex surface general type, you have a Kaller Einstein metric. And uh, what this result is saying is that the Kaller Einstein metric realizes the Yaman. Um, if it's not minimal, it's actually the same value, it's uh, invariant for blow ups, if you cannot know about the complex surfaces. Uh, in the post, and again, in the positive case, there are much less computations, but there is one, it's the YAML invariant of uh, 
of the um, CP2, the complex projective space, is realized by the Fubin student metric, the Einstein metric in CP2. You obtain this value, this value is, uh, of course, positive and is strictly less than one of the zero. And that's about uh, all the computations we can dimension for. Again, you see that you have some general computations in the non positive case, and in the positive case, you have some uh, uh, few results or single results. Um, in higher dimensions, uh, then you don't have this uh, invariant, don't, we don't have any uh, type of this invariant. So, we can see there's no generalization to higher dimensions. Geometric flows are not so um, strong, let's say, in higher dimensions. So uh, computations are more kind of topological. And then uh, in higher dimensions, you would try to do is kind of uh, go to topology to uh, uh, cover this on theorem. So uh, this means that you want to understand the behavior of invariant uh, through uh, surgery. So there was the result that I obtained with the Gabzin June in 1998 that the Yama invariant is uh, does not decrease. You do surgery in co-dimension at least three, and in the non-positive case again, it's kind of a simple case. Uh, and I said this is just a result because it sounds technical about surgery. But then uh, once you you can say something about surgery, you can use the uh, coordinate theory and prove things. And I mentioned something there that you uh, one can prove that uh, if you have a simply connecting manifold. Which does not mean metric of positive scalar curvature, that's a way to say that you know that the Yama invariant cannot be positive, then it's, a strict, it's, it's, it's equal to zero for simply connected manifolds. So there are no simply connected manifolds with negative Yama invariant. Uh, this uh, is known to be true, this result about zero surgery, about surgery in the positive case, but only in zero surgery which means that uh, you take up two points and you connect it with the two, that still works. And, um, and another general computation is this, uh, the Yama invariant of uh, S1 times another sphere. And this is very particular, this can be solved because uh, it's uh, conformally flat. So you, you push the problem to RN and you use some strong results uh, in PDEs. And that was pointed out again, at mass of more or less at the same time that I mentioned before by Kobayashi and Rick Shain. Um, essentially, let me just mention a little bit. This is done by, um, uh, you can you look at the, 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 this is going to be realized by looking at the Riemannian products where you make the S1, the circle go very large, or this N minus, SN minus one, the sphere very small. And you look at that conformal class and the thing that you can solve completely the, um, the Yama equation for the conformal class and kind of compute this, uh, that the supremum of those is going to be the Yama invariant of S here more or less directly. And uh, say so there are in higher dimension, there are no non-trivial computations. Non-trivial means that the value is different from zero or the Yama invariant of S here. So you don't have no computations uh, uh, this is strictly positive, but less than the fear. You can, you, there is no proof, no computation of a manifold which has a strictly negative uh, uh, Yama invariant. Uh, probably the, the most important conjecture in that direction is this one by Rick Shen, which has uh, the obvious thing is that uh, the metric of constant coverage relies the Yama invariant. Everyone expects to be true, but. Uh, we have nothing, so in particular in higher dimensions, uh, the hyperbolic manifold, we have negative uh, Yama invariant, and we have the values for the length spaces, for instance, kind of things. And then, for instance, I mentioned an equation, the Yama invariant of Prusko spheres. This is not computed either, one doesn't know how to, how to work with that. Um, in this case, it's in particular interesting because, I mean, as I say, I have this result about the uh, surgery in the non-positive case. And this is very important for doing general computations in, in higher dimensions using Cobordison theorem. There is no, the, the signal not that it does work for the, in the positive case, the closest to that is the work of Bernard Mann, Matthias Dahl, and Emmanuel Umbert in the 2013. Well, they got some lower bound for the, for the Yama invariant obtained by surgery. In the positive case, 
they, they don't have exactly inequality, but they have inequality where appears precisely what appears as something like uh, the Yama constant or invariance of this product of spheres somehow. So it's a particular question, but the important one because uh, understanding that might, uh, might uh, tell us how to uh, work with the, the surgery in higher dimensions. Um, I have a short question. Yes. Um, and Shane's uh, conjecture. Yes. Is it already known if, that there are local minimizers? Oh, uh, I guess some sort it, of first derivative. I guess it is known. Yeah, I don't know completely, sure, but I guess it is known because yeah, you can uh, compute like the the Hessian something like that. Security so only compute the Hessian, and I think that this is done. Uh, uh, I think that actually he he mentioned the change in, in his article. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's this famous article at the end. He said that uh, this is comp local computation, but it's a local mean. I, I, I think I haven't read that for a long time, so I forget. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Okay, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, and the other question is: do, do they know? Do they know that the minimums actually achieved, or are there some spaces? No, where not sure? no, no, no. That's that's sure. a, a, a the minimum or the maximum. The minimum is known, and I'm going to talk okay. about that later. The minimum is known that it's achieved. The maximum is not known, and this is kind of the, the big issue, a very okay. important issue. Thank because you. Thank this you. is a situation that you want to minimize, where you can minimize, but if you try to maximize, you cannot do it. Actually, this is a case where it is actually known that it's not maximized. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. always that you hit the value of the sphere. Well, I, I, will, I will come back to that question literally when I mention a few things. Okay, thank you. Um, precisely, okay, this is what, uh, what I was just saying. So I'm beginning <laughs> to talk about how, how to solve the Yama equation, right? And the, and the first thing is this thing that I could have mentioned before, but precisely I left it for later because to mention, to be talking now about the Yama equation and solutions. The thing for is always related. this is what the beginning of the story. This is what Yamabe tried to do or claimed that he did, he thought he had done, but there was some mistake in his... Uh, this article, this has to be precisely with this thing that the equation is a um, critical exponent equation. This, and so there are some difficult, uh, very um, uh, technical issues. And, uh, the, 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 it was not much known about that in the time of Yamabe. It's a little later when people began to work and understand this problem. So uh, this is one day Neil Trellinger looked at the article and realized that precisely was some kind of technical issue there. So, uh, of he, so he pointed that out, he found some um, condition under which uh, the, the argument of Yamaha still worked, and uh, essentially provided some positive constant that if uh, the Yamaha constant is less than that constant, then you can solve it. You know? Then the theory of Bain advanced that. He proved essentially that that constant I mentioned before is actually the Yama constant of the sphere. So essentially proves that if the Yama constant of the manifold is strictly less than one of the sphere, then the infimum is realized. And, uh, and he proved that it's actually the, the strict inequality in many cases. And this was uh, completed by Rick Shane uh, in the most difficult cases, the world lab, especially in conformally flat manifolds and these things. Uh, um, it's a much more complicated, difficult issue, and uh, he managed to do that. And then the, the, the question was completely solved. This was a, a very important result, fundamental results. Um, so the infimum is always realized. There is always a matter of constant scale character in any conformal class. And okay, the, if the Yama constant is positive, the infimum is a matter of constant positive scalar character. If serious, a matter of serious scalar character if it's negative. Um, a metric of negative scalar curvature. The solution follows more or less easily that is unique if the Yama constant is non positive. This is just looking at the Yama function that I saw before. Um, it's no longer the case in the positive case, in the positive case becomes very difficult, as I said. So, the, the first case, and that we already kind of see that uh, was apart, is the case of the sphere. So, in the sphere, you look at uh, homothesis in Euclidean space is multiplied by constant, any possible constant. Then with the, this gives you a conformal diffeomorphism in the sphere. You 
you look at you go to from the sphere to the space by the stereographical projection this is conformal map so this homothesis in the clean space give you a, a non-compact family of conformal homothesis in the sphere and then this uh, conformal homothesis simply pull back the constant curvature metric by conformal homothesis you will have a metric which is uh, conformal to the to the round to a constant sectional curvature metric so it's some but at the same time it's uh, isometric because it's just a pullback of the metric so it's saying that that constant uh, that function that gives you this metric as uh, conformal to the round metric is precisely a solution of the my question so you have a non-compact family of solutions actually this year kind of trivial because they are always metric of constant sexual and curvature the same metric but uh, formally, you have this uh, non-compact uh, space of solutions. You know, so you don't, you don't have uh, unicity, you, have non, you don't even have compactness. The thing of this uh, space of solution of the young equation is compact or not. It's a big issue. It was uh, many important results on that. It's been solved uh, relatively uh, recently. The other result I mentioned there is that you do, you do have uniqueness in case of uh, other Einstein metric, you have uniqueness. If it's a metric of constant, uh, metric of positive uh, constant, Einstein metric of positive constant, you still have uniqueness just for us, if you take away the, the case of the random metric and the sphere. But there, that's everything about, you know, this is kind of the only, essentially the only uniqueness result uh, in the positive case. Another case when you can easily see that you have a um, multiplicity is uh, if you look and, and I get back to this thing of a uh, product of metrics of, um, of the spheres, and then you have it. So this is SN times SM. You look at the round metric in SN, the round metric in SM. This is a Hilbert Einstein functional. And you change the the sizes of the sphere. For instance, you put a t there, and you make t go to zero or to infinity. And you check very easily that in that case the the gamma function at goes to infinity. It's just a very simple computation. And then you know that this cannot be the gamma minimizes in their classes because the gamma mass is bounded by this uh, constant of Oban that I mentioned before. So you need to have a R solution. You know that you're going to have an R solution. And actually, I mentioned some results that you actually proved that the, the number of solutions go to infinity. As t goes to zero. And so in this, probably one has to compare these things with the, uh, with the result I mentioned before, Rick Shane and Kobayashi, in the case uh, where, for instance, m is equal to one, they essentially did the same thing. The difference in that case is that they knew kind of all the solutions depend on S1. All these results of the multiplicity actually they show that the the, the the solution actually depend on only one of the variables. Yeah, but the, the big question here is that you don't know if actually there are solutions solutions which depend on trivially on on both factors. So let me just get to the last part of uh, of the last topic that was precisely more of what I was trying to motivate, and is the construction of um, of family of solutions uh, use multiplicity research in general. Almost all of these results are doing using bifurcation theory. So we say a few things about bifurcation theory. Uh, for instance, what I mentioned that the result of Jean Henri uh, was done using bifurcation. Uh, this was not, but this was very particular. Uh, using not is a very particular thing, let's say. Most of the results are using bifurcation theory. So, um, and I say this is kind of a situation, precisely I mentioned this because it's kind of a situation when you want to apply. You are very interested in standing, understanding the space of solutions, for instance, these products, and is to compute the gamma constants of these products, and it's very difficult. Um, so, it was, there was some success is in finding, at least finding a large family of solutions. And in the, in this is precisely where a situation where bifurcation theory applies, right? You have this family, trivial family of solutions of metric of constants, uh, scalar curvature, which are this product when you move the parameter t. So we, this is what I wrote. You have this trivial family of solutions. In the case I wrote it one t, the product metric, and where t is moving, is t here. 
And then the question is, do you call the family, this family of trivial solutions, of the my question, let's say, locally reached at some point of the family, if around the, in the neighborhood of, the, of that point, all, all the solutions appear, the one in the family. And in the other case, when there is some family of solutions approaching this one to not, which are not for the, from the family, you call that a bifurcation point. You, you have the image that they have this trivial family of solutions. And then at some point, some solution bifur bifurcate from that. This is kind of the idea. So the, 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 the first part is local bifurcation, which tell you which are the bifurcation points, essentially, you want to understand. This, a lot of known about that is this kind of big computer, and this is kind of the, the thing why bifurcation theory is important. And uh, the more difficult question that you always try to do, but it's much more difficult, is to understand the space of solutions. You know that you have a bifurcation point, what the family of solutions look like around that, that point. Um, so uh, there was uh, probably the, the, the start of this was uh, some work with the Lima, Piccioni, and Seda, where they, they did the general setting for this in general, for uh, doing a um, local identification for the Yama equation in this general setting, say, uh, and obtaining a lot of results about uh, um, local bifurcation. I will get back to mention some, some of the results if I still have time in a little while. Um, but uh, what I will try to discuss a little bit uh, in a few minutes is um, a simplification of this. This is kind of very difficult to understand the local electrification in general. But the, 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 the situation where one mostly tries to uh, apply it is the case of this is the Riemannian products of aberrations and uh, harmonic Riemannian formation submersions technically. There is a situation where you kind of reduce the equation to, equate to an equation in the base. Harmonic Riemannian submersion means that the the Laplacians commute, so your equation in the total space can be reduced to equation in the base, and you look for solutions which only depends on the base. So you end up in a situation like this when you try to solve an equation will look like this, where lambda is kind of a, more or less the scalar curvature of the total space. And I put a Q here instead of P because uh, you, you are looking at the equation in the base. So the Q is a critical exponent in the total space, and it's going to be some subcritical actual equation on the base. And so you end up with these kind of equations. And again, uh, now it's very simple because your equation is in the base, is this, this is fixed. The metric G is fixed, it's not moving throughout the family. Um, and, uh, and again, you have your, uh, your trivial solution. In this case, uh, one is always a solution. And, uh, you try to understand when which value of lambda, of lambda are bifurcation points. And then uh, you, to do that, you have to linearize the equation, take the derivative of this in the direction of u, and you will end up, and you very easy to see, you end up with this equation. So essentially, if the linearization is uh, to be, uh, um, to have a kernel, it's essentially the eigenvalue equation for the Laplace. And we know um, a lot of things about that. I mean, you, about that essentially, but uh, in general, in many situations, you can say a lot about this uh, plus and gain values. And in this situation, I mean, it's kind of true in the sense that if you have a, a solution of that uh, again value problem, you have bifurcation, which is highly non trivial problem in general. This is what was uh, dealt by in that work by the Lima, Pichon, and Seda that I mentioned before. This uh, is the next thing is just a comment that actually. Most of the situation, the most of this is the, the scheme that I mentioned to reduce it to the function on the basis. It's a reduction, but actually you get uh, most of the solutions in this in this case, most of the non-solution in this case. So um, let me, in, and actually even there that you know that uh, you have a bifurcation point, but even you want to say something more, it's difficult and, uh, but you can say something, much uh, clear if uh, you have actually simple eigenvalues. This uh, dimension of this uh, the linearization is uh, the kernel has dimension one. So let me um, try, I don't need to 
say something about that. So let me just get to this because I don't have much time. Um, the space of solution around the kitchen points given by the solution of this bifurcation equation. This is D here is the dimension of the kernel of this linearization. I mean, the thing is that if there is no kernel, essentially what you have is that the, in the direction of U, let's say that the, the map is an isomorphism and then you apply the implicit function theorem in that in this situation and you will get that the space solution is just a line and this the only you have already a line of trivial solutions so there are no more solutions if the linearization doesn't have a kernel um, you are uh, the the point is a local, locally rigid point uh, if not you have this uh, map that which can be explained where we come from but i don't want to say much about that from a uh, the dimension of the kernel plus one, the plus one has to do with the duration of lambda, or you know that the equation is constantly equal to zero because this having a solution in RD. And you have to solve this equation. I mean, essentially, generally in bifurcation theory, you end up with this bifurcation equation. You have to say it has solution, non trivial solutions or not. And this is, of course, it's just a, you reduce it to a finite dimensional equation, but it still is impossible to solve in general. But if uh, D is equal to one in a simple case, you simply have a map from R2 to R, and this is something that we know how to do. The, the point is you always uh, the critical point, and then you have to go look for the Hessian. If it's non-degenerate, which you can check more or less easy, just taking derivative, you can apply more theory. In, 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 in a lot of time, since the, the second derivative in the direction of lambda is zero, you can only have to look at the diagonal. If the, the diagonal, the things are non-zero, you will have a non-degenerate critical point of index one. The function locally will look like uh, we are in dimension two. So index one, the function locally will look like x squared minus y squared. And then you have two lines, x minus one, x plus y equal to zero. You have two lines. One is a line of trivial solution, and you have one other line, which are the non-constant solutions. Um, so I think I'm running out of time, right? Oh, I have five minutes or something like that. You have you have ten minutes. Oh, ten minutes. Okay, so I'm fine. Yeah, I think. Um, okay, so let me. So this was in, in the case of uh, simple eigenvalues. It's simpler. You you have much more. You have you can say that uh, you you have a bifurcation point. You have so non-trivial solution. You have to say that actually that you have a line, the path of curve of uh, non-trivial solutions, and you actually you can say more. You can check the derivative of this uh, bifurcation curve. You can say a lot of things, um, and the thing is that actually most of the situation you can reduce it. The extreme way you can say something, you can reduce it to this situation, and this is why I was mentioning the case of the fear. In the case of the fear. Um, I mean, let me, I just mentioned, let me go back a little bit. So this is uh, when, in the case of the, when the basis around sphere, this is the, the typical eigenvalues, the rotated eigenvalues of the sphere. Um, it's known that the eigenfunctions are the harmonic, uh, the homogeneous polynomials in degree k for, k for this k here. Um, K equals one corresponds to the first eigenvalue are the linear functions actually in a space of dimension n plus one and the other uh, uh, eigenvalues actually the dimension grows in general the, the, the dimension of the solution in the field is going to be huge because of all the symmetries in particular of the field. But you just look at the, the, the linear functions and okay, the space has dimension n plus one, but you can simply reduce it because you look at uh, uh, every linear function is invariant by some action of the ON in the direction, let's say, orthogonal to, to the linear function. So you simply reduce the equation, to you, your equation to function which are invariant by this, this action of ON. And then when you draw, so you will get an ODE because we're a function which depends on only one variable and it should be called a second order of the E that you can see it has some symmetries or some restrictions on the on the endpoint, so the space of solution we have at most dimension one, essentially in this case is trivial. This, this space solution will be, the, will be the linear function invariant by the, um, the, the action of O n that we fixed. 
And uh, I mentioned here something about the, this is kind of the simplest case. I mean, just look at the uh, co-dimension one action on the seer and uh, look at restrict to function which are invariant by this action. So we will end up in this simple eigenvalue situation. The most general case where you can do that is in a, in a manifold where you have an isoparametric function. It's a whole story about isoparametric function, a function which uh, verify these things that you can write the gradient of f square as a function of f. Let's say the gradient of f, the norm of the gradient of f is constant about, uh, along the level set thesis of f. And also a Laplacian is constant about the level set thesis of f. And in this case, the thing is that uh, you can write the Laplacian of p composed with f will always be again a function composed with f. This is kind of the thing. Then uh, your Yama equation reduces to equation with essentially is this one, b is a function, then then phi is a function defined on r. So you end up with an OBE and you, have, you are in the same situation that uh, I mentioned before. So, um, and again, you can do for this thing, you can uh, do the local bifurcation and you have, you know that you have a branch of solutions and then this is kind of what you can say, most of what you can say about using a local bifurcation and then the bifurcation points, then you have this uh, family of solutions that uh, um, Converge to the, the bifurcation point, and you try to understand the connected components of solutions that uh, uh, that appear at the bifurcation point. In general, I mean, it's, it's very little you can say, but in the case of um, of simple eigenvalues, when you have simple eigenvalues, you can uh, you can say something. Um, so. You, in the, in the thing that we're going to say something, this is a classical result of Rabinovich in the 70s that essentially tells you did. Technically, it's more complicated, but uh, applied to the situation that I mentioned, it says that if you look at the curves of solution that appear at the application point, you have two chances. One is if they don't intersect, I mean, if they are disjoint. I mean, in each bifurcation point, they appear in some curve of solutions. So this has, Curve solution don't intersect each other, don't go to the trivial line of solutions again. And then the connected components of this solution is non compact. And then I mentioned to end this result, this recent result with Alejandro Betancourt de la Parra, Julio Batalla, uh, that essentially we apply uh, all these situations to the general situation where you have uh, an isoparametric function property, just some condition, but it's a uh, the general case. And then, it, then you have this sequence of solutions uh, of lambda case that goes to infinity. We have to do with the eigenvalues of, uh, of the Laplacian on M. So that for any lambda in the, between this lambda K, lambda K plus one, you have at least K solutions, which are F invariant. F invariant is this function composed with F. And uh, essentially this is understanding, I mean, the, the local bifurcation and then applying this here. And what you have to do is understand how the, this branch of solutions uh, that appear in the bifurcation points are uh, cannot intersect each other. So rule out this situation that uh, uh, for uh, to apply Rabinovich theorem. And then, uh, then you know that this, the, these uh, branches that appear are non-compact. And then uh, since again, I mentioned that uh, mentioned briefly that uh, when you do this, when you go to the base manifold, you end up with some subcritical equation. Actually, in this case, it's kind of easy to see that actually um, if uh, the value of lambda is bounded, lambda to infinity, the space of solution is going to be compact. The space of solution for lambda fix is compact, more or less trivial if it's subcritical. And if this is lambda is bounded, you still have compactness. So, um, so essentially, if you have this non-compact family, it means that this path of solutions have either to go to zero or to plus infinity and have a chance, and then, then you need another technical result that uh, they cannot go to zero. So necessarily, they go to infinity. So all these branches that appear at some bifurcation point go to infinity, so they will have to hit every value of lambda uh, beyond lambda, okay? And uh, that's how you get uh, uh, this 
you are, when you do this for each rectification point, so when you pass a lambda k, you already have at least k solution coming from all the previous eigenvalues. So, okay, that's all. Uh, thank you for the. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we should clap if we can. Or <laughs> should we clap? Um, so uh, we're, we're starting in three minutes with uh, Raquel Paralysis talk. So let's uh, hold the questions until after the second talk. So perhaps Raquel should share. Everyone can take one I minute should, break while we set up. I have to stop post share. Okay. Yeah. The, the rest of the audience can take a one minute break while we set up. It's, it's looking good. Oh, my phone. Maybe I should hide my phone or turn off, turn off my phone. I'll hide it. Hide it. Okay. <laughs> My iPad says January. Your iPad says January? Yes. I mean, I've seen <laughs> other iPads doing that, but I didn't notice that mine too. Okay, that's... That's odd, actually. You're right. Mm -hmm. Saying January when I'm in the Zoom, but it doesn't say January when I'm outside the Zoom. Yes, yes, I... Yeah. Hmm. All right, so now it's time. Um, has everyone returned? Yes? Okay. Uh, so the next speaker is Raquel Perales. She also received her doctorate at Stony Brook uh, more recently than uh, our last speaker. Uh, Raquel did a postdoc at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California, and since has worked as a Quanisit uh, Research Fellow at UNAM in Oaxaca is now a scientist there. Her research has concerned the uh, Riemannian geometry of manifolds with boundary, um, gromov hausdorff and intrinsic flag convergence of sequences of Riemannian manifolds, and also RCD spaces, which are a generalization of Riemannian manifolds with Ricci curvature bounded below, but they are metric spaces, metric measure spaces. So uh, we're delighted to have her speak on upper bound on the revised first Beatty number and torus stability for RCD spaces. Thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, and actually, I mean, I'm going to talk about some results of a paper. And this paper was generalizing um, very classic theorems that already existed in the smooth setting. And let us first discuss the smooth setting. So in the smooth setting, we will have a closed Riemannian manifold, and then we can define the first fundamental group of that manifold. We can also define the commutator of our uh, first fundamental group, which I'm going to denote by H. So here is the commutator. And then we can define um, the first petty number. 
So the first Betty number of our manifold M is the rank of this uh, group. In this group, well, this is an abelian group, and it's uh, going to be the abelianization of our first fundamental group. So it's by one M mod out by the commutator of the, of the group. And uh, we know that this is actually isomorphic to this. Uh, okay, so then let us start now that we um, remember what is the first um, uh, Betty number. And Buckner in 1946 uh, proved the following result. So let us start with a um, Riemannian manifold M, which is going to be of dimension N, this is important and it's going to be closed. So that means compact with no boundary and orientable. And assume that uh, its Ricci curvature is non-negative. And then what one can say is that the first Betty number is actually bounded by the dimension of our manifold. And the quality is going to happen if our manifold is the flat torus. Okay. And this was done using uh, the first cohomology group of uh, the first um, Hodge cohomology group of one forms. Uh, and later on, Gromov and Gallo, uh, uh, what they did is uh, it's um, changed this condition. So, what we are going to do now, instead of uh, asking for reaching non negative, is the following condition, okay? So we are going to ask um, Ricci multiplied by the diameter of our manifold square to be negative, and it's going to be um, almost, almost zero, okay? And, and so let me read this theorem. So we fix a dimension n, and then there will be a number which is small depending on that dimension such that any Riemannian manifold closed that satisfies this condition will have a first Betty number bounded by the dimension of the manifold. Okay, so then um, as you can see, Gromov and Gallo didn't address the equality case and that was addressed by Colding. So Colding in 1997 uh, studied the following. So again, given a dimension for our manifolds, there will exist this uh, small number, positive small number, such that if you have a closed Riemannian manifold that satisfies Ricci almost, um, almost zero. And now we have the equality of the first Petit number, so equal to the dimension of the manifold. Okay, then our manifold is going to be homeomorphic to a torus, if n is greater than three, or homotopically equivalent to a torus if n equals three. Okay, and then so here, here you see it's uh, only homeomorphic, or only this other condition. But uh, Bochner result actually said that it was um, a flat torus. So we, we want uh, to push more in this direction. And what Chigger and Colding proved three years later was that actually under these conditions, you are going to have to be, or your manifold has to be by holder to a flat torus. Okay, so these are the theorems that I want to discuss in a non-smooth setting. And these are the theorems that we are going to reprove. Okay, but before passing to the non-smooth setting, let me recap what happens in this uh, Riemannian world. And in this Riemannian world, we have a manifold, which is a Riemannian manifold. Then we can define the universal cover of the manifold. We can define first fundamental group. Uh, we can define the commutator. And I haven't talked about this, but the proofs are going to involve uh, these guys. So these guys are going to be first a covering of our space M. So actually we have something like this. So we have universal cover 
we have this cover M, and then we are going to have our original manifold M. Okay, and instead of working with the universal cover directly, we, we, we are going to work with this uh, covering. Okay, so we have this covering in space, and we will actually also work with another covering M prime, and then pass to M. That's how the proof is, go is going to go. Okay, but so, and, and let me remind you again, in the Riemannian case, this, this is true. In the non-smooth setting, we will have to, to work a little bit more. And, um, and well, to define this M prime, what we are going to do is going, we are going to take as a group of this gamma, and remember, well, maybe I didn't mention, but this gamma, yeah, I, I did mention, is the abelianization of our first fundamental group. So we will take this subgroup. Uh, let me just don't write it. Okay, so we will take this uh, subgroup of, of this group, and um, we are going to define this question. Anyway, you, you will see how this is defined later on. And now let me pass to the non-smooth setting. And this non-smooth setting is called uh, RCDKN spaces. So these RCDKN spaces uh, mean uh, this Riemannian curvature and dimension. And this is going to be a metric space, metric measure space. So we have a measure. And it means that um, the Ricci in a synthetic way of this space is going to be bounded by K. And the dimension of this space is going to be bounded uh, by N. Okay, so, so naturally, well, so we will, we will have manifolds included in this class. And I'm going to skip a lot of details, but the story started with these uh, people, with Lot and Bilani. They uh, published a paper and a storm. So everything started with uh, these three people. And then many other people came. Um, they didn't define the class of RCD spaces. They defined a larger class. And then at the end, well, not at the end, and some years later, Gigli, Ambrosio, and Sabare define what it was to be this, this class, which is smaller and has better properties. Okay, so let us just uh, give some definitions so you have an idea of these RCD spaces. And as I told you, we will have a metric space and uh, we are going to have also a measure. And we require some conditions on this metric space, but I like to start with um, explaining these conditions. So this condition, it's uh, an integrated version of Bochner inequality. So remember that in Bochner inequality, we will have um, this part, uh, probably Laplacian La here, and we are going to have this one. Well, actually this appears as a Hessian, but then we can convert it to this expression. We have this, and here we have the Ricci term. So we have Ricci term, but if our manifold satisfies Ricci greater or equal than K, so we can put it here. So this is a weak Bochner inequality. Okay, so it makes sense that this space is satisfied Ricci uh, greater than or equal to K. And then these other conditions are more technical. What one can do, because one has a measure, then we can construct a W12 space. And this W12 space, we want it to be a Hilbert space, which that happens when, what, when one has Riemannian manifolds. Okay, the, this other condition is just telling us that Lipschitz functions are dense in this space. And this other condition is telling us some, something about the measure, that it's not too bad, that our measure is not too bad. But uh, let's just keep in mind the uh, Wick-Bogner inequality, okay? 
And now, why is this class of spaces so good? Well, as I told you, this is a generalization of what it means for a manifold to have um, a curvature bound below, a rich curvature um, bound below, and dimension less or equal than n. So this class contains these manifolds. It also contains, oh my God, here is a, yeah, don't read this. It also contains gromov hausdorff limits of these uh, Riemannian manifolds with a Ricci curvature lower bound and a dimension upper bound. It also contains Alexandrov spaces. And it also contains uh, products. Well, sorry, uh, what I wanted to say, it also contains quotients and foliations and many other um, many other spaces, which one studies in, in geometry. It also contains manifolds with bakri emery Ricci lower bounds. And it satisfies many nice conditions that manifolds also satisfy. And here I'm just writing some examples. There are more properties that this space satisfy. But for example, bishop Gromov, uh, volume comparison, Laplacian comparison, chigger Gromov splitting, um, Theorem also holds, and many inequalities, um, many inequalities for the heat flow. And another thing that we can also define is a universal cover, and that's why we're going to study the theorems that I presented you at the beginning. And one can study instead of the the first fundamental group, we are going to study something that is going to be called a revised fundamental group, okay? But for this, we have the following slide. Okay, so let me just uh, try to set up some uh, definitions of what we will mean by a universal covering and uh, the groups that we are going to study. Okay, so given a space X, we say that a universal cover for this space X is going to be um, a covering map. So something like this. Okay, this, uh, this covering map or this Y has to satisfy that it's uh, connected and we require uh, a commutative triangle to be satisfied as we learn in topology. Okay, and, and now notice that this space, this universal cover space that we are requiring is not necessarily going to be simply connected. So not necessarily, caution. I, maybe I don't know how to write this. Simply connected, okay. But we are going to have uh, this universal cover space. Okay, and now uh, we define the group of deck transforms, which is given a covering map. We define um, this group to be uh, all the homeomorphisms from Y to Y that satisfy our uh, commutative triangle. And then what we define is the first fundament, the revised first fundamental group. And this is just going to be uh, the group that I just defined, taking here the universal cover, and we are going to put a bar here. And this was defined, I think, by uh, Sormani and Wes. Okay, and they did study this, this group. And now I want to convince you that even though we are going to replace the uh, fundamental group by this other group, it is still a very nice group. And why, why it is still a very nice group? Well, because we will have again a bijection between the group and the fibers. We are going to have that X is going to be isomorphic to the quotient of um, the covering the covering Y mod out by the group of deck transformations, and we still have this isomorphism. Okay, so it's still very good to work with this space. 
or with this group. And now I can start telling you about the results that we proved in this non-smooth case. Well, the first one, we didn't prove it, but it's very necessary, okay? So we are going to be in this class of RCDK in spaces. And Mondino and Wafer show, as I told you before, that any RCD space will have a universal cover space and this universal cover space satisfies the same uh, Ricci curvature bound and dimension bound, okay? This is very straightforward for Riemannian manifolds, but when one is in, in this class, uh, we have to work a little bit more. And that's why this is a nice result. And then, um, as I told you before, now we are going to use this group. So we need a definition of um, first betting number. And our first betting number or revised first betting number is going to be um, this quantity. So it's going to be the rank of the abelianization of bar by one X, okay? Which we can define it in this way because um, Mondello, Mondino, and myself prove that this is finitely generated. And this just follows right away from work of uh, Sormani and Beng and Wei. Then another thing that we show to start working on, on our problems is that when we take our universal cover that we know that exists and mod out by the commutator, so this is H, sorry. So when we mod out our uh, universal cover space by this H, then the resulting space is also an RCDKN space. And we will have, as I told you before, this like tower of spaces. So we have X, then we have this X bar, then we have our RCD space, and Soon you will notice, well, actually I, I won't, and we will have this X prime. Okay. So all of them are coverings, all of them are RCD spaces, and they have the same curvature bounds as the original one, as X. Okay. So now we can, um, well, first the photos. So these are the photos. These are my collaborators. This is a uh, Mondello, and, and they are, I mean, the photos are in alphabetical order, Mondino, and this is myself. Okay, so now, okay, so what did we prove? Mm, so we are going to fix a dimension bound. We will find an epsilon that is positive and small and depends on this dimension bound so that any compact RCDK in space so XDM, that satisfies these conditions. So it's the diameter squared multiplied by the Ricci bound. Uh, if it's uh, greater than or equal to minus epsilon N, then it will also satisfy that this first revised um, or revised first Betty number is bounded by this dimension. And here we are just writing floor of N. This is a natural number. So it's uh, natural to take the floor of our number because this number might not be natural, okay? So that's uh, gromov kalotz theorem. And now we wonder about the rigidity case. So what happens when this is equal to, to that? Okay, uh, and again, well, we change a little bit the notation, but just think this is an epsilon, okay? And we have this equality. So then we are going to, because we are not in manifolds, we have to prove different things, but at the end we arrive to, to what we really want. So we want to be by holder homeomorphic to a flat torus. Okay, so let me read this one. So this one says, if your dimension bound is actually an integer number, then what is going to happen is that 
your measure is just house of measure of the right dimension and multiply by some positive constant. Okay, and then in this case, we get that our metric space is by homeomorphic to an n-dimensional flat torus. And because we are showing at the end that this is a, um, a torus, we actually get that our revised first bet number in this case is then uh, regular betting number, first betting number. Okay. This is a little bit more technical, but we are just saying that our space can be covered by, by Lipschitz charts, which um, are defined from subsets contained in Rn. Okay. So we have charts that go from Rn to X. And this one, it says that we are Gromhauser close to a flat torus. Okay, so, and, and now uh, just to finish, let me give you some, I, some of the ideas, but in the smooth setting, because these are easy, easier to, to explain, okay? So the first theorem that I want to give you some ideas is this one. So how do we get the, the bound on the first petty number that is less or equal than the dimension of our manifold? Okay, so basically we, we want to find this epsilon. Okay, and to find this epsilon, what we are going to do is study this um, manifold. So this manifold is again, universal covered space divided, well, mod out or the quotient of by this group, which is uh, the commutator of our first fundamental group. And then, uh, everything is a little bit combinatoric and we just have to mix two ideas. So these two ideas are the following and both ideas were proven by Gromov. So one thing is this one in which um, we have our first fundamental group, we mod out by H, we get this abelian group. And what we are going to do is find a subgroup generated by some elements of this group. Okay, and this group is going to satisfy the following. It's actually going to be isomorphic to set to the big one M. And what it's going to do is the following. If we take a non-trivial element and we are fixing this uh, point X bar, what it's going to do is going to take it far away. I mean, the, this gamma is going to take it far away from this and far away quantified in this way, okay? So we, we are actually fixing the way, how far we want um, our elements in the group to move, to move our fixed point, okay? And the other thing is that the generators are going to move our fixed point, but not too much. And not too much means in this way. So we, the picture is basically this X bar, here I have for k equal to one. Here, let's say we have the first diameter of m, and then here I have the ball of two times diameter of m. And this x gamma is going to be moved, sorry, x bar is going to be moved here, only in this part. So, so x bar is in the covering space. Yes, in, in M bar. Yeah. Yes, thank you. We are in M bar. Okay, so that is what is happening. Okay, and now that we have these nice groups, let me just remember remind you of um, uh, Bishop Gromov volume comparison. And it tells you that for any Riemannian manifold that has these uh, richy lower bounds, this function, which is the quotient of two volumes, so volume of a ball in our Riemannian manifold divided by the volume of um, the model space. So this is model space. Um, so simply connected of curvature, sectional curvature equal to K and dimension equal to N. Okay, so it's a volume of a ball of radius r 
in this space. Okay, so, so this function is, oh, this should be an X, is non-increasing. And if it's non-increasing, well, you can um, evaluate that some two values are bigger than, than smaller R and find this quantity. And this quantity is going to appear soon. That's why I wrote it there, okay? Okay, now let me uh, tell you how to prove the theorem. So we want to find an epsilon such that if this is small, then our first Betty number is going to be bounded by n. And I told you, this is just a counting argument and we are going to use uh, our previous uh, results. So we take k equal to one. And so we find a subgroup gamma one, which is generated by these elements. Here I'm forgetting the m, but it's, it's generated by this number of elements of this subgroup, okay. And what it does is what I told you, uh, we move po points far away by, by this quantity, but not too far away by this quantity. And then what happens is that actually this condition is telling you or is telling us that the balls that have reduced diameter of m divided by two, uh, and center this uh, point, all of these families are going to be, sorry, all these balls are going to be mutually disjoint, okay? And actually, now we are going to cover a bigger ball by mutually disjoint balls. And what we are going to do is, is define a set of our group, gamma one. And this set is just going to be all the elements that can be written as this sum. Remember, this, this group is abelian and that's why I can write this sum. So I, I, I write them, I take elements that I can write in this way. And what I required to this, um, my requirements for this L1s to LP1 is that this happens. So the absolute value of them, the sum of the absolute values of them is less or equal than R and that they are integers, the, the LIs, okay? And then with this definition, notice right away that B1 is less or equal than the cardinality of this set. If uh, I take a reduce greater or equal than one. And if I take an integer, I, I can count actually this very easily. And this is going to be two R plus one. Well, in, in the cardinality of this is two R plus one, to the power b1. Okay, so now what, what do we do? Well, I told you, we, we wanted to cover a bigger ball by disjoint balls. So what we are going to do is basically take elements in the IR, take the balls um, centered at gamma, which gamma is this one, x bar, evaluated at x bar of balls of in the radius diameter of m over two. And because of our conditions, it's going to lie in, in this ball of this precise radius. And as I told you, they are, they are also going to be disjoint, okay? So basically, since we have this containment, we can calculate the volume of this part, which is going to be this one, and then add the volume of all these balls. And this is what we have here, okay? Very well. And then we can bound this, which is this one. So what we have is the quotient of this thing divided by this. And that was uh, our Ricci Gromov, uh, sorry, our Bishop Gromov volume comparison theorem that I presented. Let me go here. So here we have this bound, okay? So this is what one uses here to bound here. Mm -hmm. So this only depends on the Ricci bound and our dimension and um, the radius, how big our balls are. That's it. And now we can use some Taylor expansion for this function, which is very explicit. It's just hyperbolic signs. And once one um, does that, so we Taylor expand, and we want 
actually this thing to be to be small, right? So we span, expand around zero. So for this quantity small, we get that this is bounded in this way. Okay, and then we are going to get a contradiction because here we have this bound, but we also have this other bound, which if we assume that this doesn't happen, so this is bigger than n, then we will we will reach this problem. Okay, they they won't match. Okay, uh, and how much time do I have now? Christina, I think your microphone is off. So it's 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 time up, I believe. Um, it's twelve forty two, and your talk runs until yeah, so fourteen forty. Okay. So if you have one last thing you want to say, you could say. Okay. It. Okay. Thank you. So now, um, it was the how how do we prove the second result? And the second result is that remember that we are a uh, byholder to a flat torus. And let me just explain you in, in one minute. So what one does first is um, show that our manifold M, M bar is gromov hausdorff close to a ball in Euclidean space, okay? Uh -huh. So now, uh, now that we are gromov hausdorff close to, to these Euclidean balls, and this was the effective way to, to do this proof, is the following. So we are going to do some uh, of hausdorff convergence. So we take a sequence of manifolds, okay? Then what we have with this sequence of manifolds that satisfy these conditions, we can take these coverings of them, and then these will converge to Euclidean space. But then we have manifolds acting here. Sorry, we have groups acting on these manifolds. And these groups are also going to, and actually remember, these are sets to the big one or to the n, because now n is fixed. And this is actually also going to converge to a group that is also c to the n. So the quotients, so these quotients are going to converge to a flat torus. And once that we have this, uh, remember that we wanted to say that we have an epsilon. So the end game uh, is the following theorem that says that if you have a gromov hausdorff closeness, well, there exists an epsilon such that if you have gromov hausdorff closeness, then M and N have to be by holder. Okay, and that's where you get that you have this by holder thing. Okay, and well, I'm going to skip this, but now I guess it makes sense what I told you about. Uh, we have to replace this gromov hausdorff closeness uh, using something called Montino neighbors almost splitting. And I guess that's it. Thank you for your attention and the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we have to do questions for both uh, both speakers uh, at the same time, and um, so we will speak. We'll start with questions on uh, Dr. Petain's talk. Perhaps uh, Jimmy, you can put on your screen again. Okay. <laughs> So perhaps it would be nice if you just went to one of your favorite theorems uh, <laughs> as a starting point for our. Um, so let me know if you have questions, everybody. You can turn off your mic and, I mean, you can turn on your mics <laughs> and ask questions. This, okay, I'll, I'll ask one first. Um, when you, in this proof, it's, it's an existence proof. 
But do you have also some properties of these various solutions as well as the fact that they exist? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, uh, for instance, let me just, for this last theorem, uh, in general, what you know is that the solutions are these F invariant solutions. So if you have, um, for instance, in the case of a homogeneity, one action, you have is the functions are invariant by this uh, homogeneity, one action. You also, you know that, and you also know that kind of the number of critical points this one has. Right, because this comes from the constant solution and they appear like at the, this certain, uh, they appear as the refugiation points as because of certain solutions of the Laplace and again value problem. So this, depending on how many zeros this, the, the Laplace again value again function has, this is going to tell you the number of peaks of the solution that appear at that bifurcation point. And precisely one thing that it was saying that it was necessary that they don't, uh, the branch of solution don't intersect. The way to prove it is that uh, you can see that the, this number of peaks remain constant along the curve. That's everything that you can say. But Thank you. Let me get a picture of that. Are there other questions? Um, I'm not hearing any questions yet. Just want to make sure. Wait, I hear someone slightly. Let me just double check in the chat. Just excellent talks. <laughs> excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Let's uh, switch to Raquel then. Raquel, do you want to share now? Oh, let me just So actually, I already have a question for Raquel, which is about these last two slides, I guess. How are you able to... Just a little bit of a discussion, how you're able to extend from a smooth setting. I don't hear, maybe you're muted. Ah, thank you. Okay. So I just yeah. was curious how you're able to extend from a smooth setting some of these results before. Yeah, uh, yeah. Gromov and Galotz, uh Theorem is actually kind of straightforward once that you prove that the covering, the X bar, the one X bar, mm -hmm. that this one is uh, an RCDK in space. Okay. Uh, and then is the other conditions, um, we first actually proved this uh, Gromov house of uh, closeness to a flat torus. And this, this uses the almost split thing theorem by Mondino and neighbor, which you study these uh, excess functions in instead of doing this kind of replace harmonic replacement that Sugar and Colding did. That's a different uh, proof, okay. Yeah, and this is done again by induction. And what you have to do is show that every time that you, you want to keep splitting lines or almost splitting lines. You want to, to get more factors, more RK factors. And what you want to say is that then this uh, other factor has big diameter. So then you can start splitting. Mm. And what about the, these, these actually these two conditions, they rely on um, like more recent theory of RCD spaces like Bruen and Semola that defined, I mean, that show that uh, these spaces have an essential dimension. So basically uh, the floor of N. Um, yeah. Some questions, I have more, but I, let's give <laughs> other people a chance. Other, other questions? I see shaking heads. Maybe I will ask one more question. Okay, I will ask another question. 
Are there examples showing that if the n is not an integer? Are, is there what? Uh, this, is there a uh, hope that someone might make a count example? That I don't know. Yes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So the buy holder you say is coming from some newer work of who you said? Uh, well, in our case, the by holder on memorific that was Mondino Kapovic. Mondino Kapovic, okay. Yeah. And, and actually, yes, first, maybe I light a bit. Uh, we proved the pointed Kromov Hausdorff convergence to, to this uh, flat torus. And right. then you have to, to study what is going on with the measure. And then you say that then you have measured Kromov Hausdorff house of closeness, and then you apply this mondino kapovic theorem because only works for uh, MGH closeness. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. right, thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions in general? Mm -hmm. well, thank you both for wonderful talks. Um, appreciate it very much. Um, I guess we'll give one last round and thank you very much to all the organizers uh, for inviting the speakers and inviting us to introduce everybody and um, organizing this beautiful event. So let's give them a round of applause too. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor Sormani for, for this wonderful work and all the speakers and, and all the people that are here together with us, uh, this was a wonderful event. Um, I want to express my gratitude to everyone for their time and their work and their effort. Um, as you know, this is a series of workshops that we have been doing for the last... No, it's not. Uh, sorry? Oh. Okay, maybe someone has its microphone on. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, so I'm making a closing statement for, for this workshop. Um, thanking again, everyone. And taking the opportunity to tell you that in here in Tuas and Tian, we're thinking about what comes next after this, uh, this uh, session. As some of you may know, uh, we started this effort during the pandemic. So we started in a, in a virtual uh, modus. And, uh, but we were thinking about uh, moving these workshops to be presential ones. And so it's uh, my pleasure to announce to you that uh, we're planning uh, a new version of this workshop uh, for this fall. So uh, this, this workshop will be organized by, uh, by us and Paolo Piccioni and a lot of more people. Uh, th this workshop will take place um, tentatively uh, between September 12th and 16th. And it will take place in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, I uh, invite you to stay tuned to our uh, networks to uh, uh, become more, uh, take more information. Uh, you will be informed with more detail about what the workshops will be and what's the, the whole uh, program. This being said, um, I thank you all for coming and I wish you a wonderful night, afternoon or morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.